Great. Thank you all very much for staying with us post-lunch. That's always good news when people stick around. My name is Alex Vatank. I'm a senior fellow here at Jamestown Foundation and at the Middle East Institute. Uh, I'll be one of the speakers, but also the moderator for this next panel. We have about an hour and 15 minutes, so hopefully um, Glenn Howard, the president of Jamestown, who has kindly invited us here, he'll give us the full time. Um, we have, as you can see, uh, four wonderful speakers plus me. Uh, you have their full bios in your uh, packets, so I won't do a full introduction, but I will start by just saying a few words about what each speak, excuse me, speaker plans to, uh, to talk about. So uh, Nick Harass here uh, will be the first speaker. Nick is a security fellow at the Center for a New American Strategy, uh, and his uh, talk, and I'm hoping we could all st stick to about 10, 15 minutes if that's okay. Uh, thank you. His talk will be about what is happening with the ISIS caliphate now being destroyed, how is ISIS trying to uh, kind of reinvent itself, and what challenges will it pose to the United States in places like Syria, Iraq, and, and Yemen. And I apologize in advance if I um, do your surnames any injustices, but Shahab, our good friend from Jordan, Shahab uh, Makahle, will, uh, who is the executive director of the Jewish Strategic Media Center, uh, will talk about Jordan developing its new strategy in terms of dealing with the terrorist threat uh, inside Jordan, but also what's happening uh, around Jordan, uh, obviously with Syria, I'm sure, at the forefront of what the Jordanians are uh, thinking about. Mitat Chelikpala, uh, how was that? Fine. Fine, thank you. Who is the uh, Dean of the Fa Faculty of Economics, Administrative and Social Sciences is at Kadir Hash University, Istanbul, will talk to us about how the Turks are looking at this changing global landscape, I'm, I'm sorry, changing regional landscape, in particular what um, Russia and Iran and their policies mean from Ankara's viewpoint as the Turks decide their steps going forward. Uh, Pavel. Felgenhauer, obviously, who is someone everyone in the room knows and a regular contributor to Jamestown, will be talking about Russia's strategic uh, desires for the region, but specifically looking at the long-term roots of what Russia is trying to do in the Eastern Mediterranean. And yours truly, coming at the very end, if there is any time left, will say a few words about what is motivating the Iranian regime in terms of their Syrian uh, policies going forward. I am of the view that that debate hasn't settled just yet. So with that said, uh, Nick, why don't you go ahead and start, please? Well, thank you very much, Alex, and thank you for everyone here in attendance to the Jamestown Foundation for inviting me to speak today. Um, very quickly, I'll just uh, draw your attention to the map uh, behind me, which shows just where we are now in terms of the state of play inside of Syria. I'll begin by saying in the three years since the US-led uh, coalition counter-ISIS campaign began, uh, late September, early October 2014, Syria has become both less complex and more complex. It has become less complex because the number of armed groups that are participating in the conflict has gone down. However, it's become more complex because the number of foreign actors that have direct territorial control inside of Syria has gone up. And I just start this presentation by saying that the U.S., uh, through its uh, buy, with, and through strategy, and building up the Syrian Democratic Forces Coalition, the SDF, um, and conducting the counter-ISIS campaign, has become, for all intents and purposes, a local actor in the conflict. You'll notice in the map, uh, just very briefly, so we have this, the same context, uh, red is Assad government and uh, allies control. The black is what's left of ISIS's would-be caliphate. You can see it's mainly centered, uh, what's left of it is in the far eastern provinces of Deir ez-Zor and in the Syrian desert region of Homs, with a small affiliate in the far southwest of the map by Israel and Jordan, and a small affiliate in the northwest central area of the map, the province of Homs. Um, you'll see in the upper right corner in the northeastern part of the country the core area of control of what is called the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria. Uh, that is the local governance that's being built up uh, by, a, by Kurds, by Arabs, by uh, Armenians, by 
uh, Assyrians and other groups. And in that purplish blue color that you see that's centered on Raqqa and that stretches as a crescent from the north central all the way to the southeast in Derizor, that's what I call the periphery uh, zone, the zone that had been uh, conquered from ISIS recently, that has fallen for the moment under the interim uh, control of the SDF, and which is really going to be the main area of contention when we look at how ISIS uh, will try to contest uh, the U.S.-led coalition effort uh, to build stability in Syria. So about in 2014, when I was speaking here at this conference, we had a discussion on the non-state threats to the Islamic State. And at the time, I had said that you know, one of the major goals would be to create a tribal uprising, or to create uh, uprisings against uh, the newly empowered would-be caliphate of ISIS. That didn't occur. And then in fact, over the interim three years, what has had to happen is that the US-led coalition and the Assad government and its allies have had to lead an external campaign against ISIS. Uh, that has significance that I'll get to in a moment. Um, you know, part of, the, part of the challenge when we look at how ISIS has transi is transitioning from a state-like actor to an insurgency is that ISIS understands that we understand that that's its strategy. Uh, there's a whole body of literature from uh, terrorism analysts and uh, counter-jihadist analysts that talk about how ISIS and its various incarnations uh, from Al-Qaeda in Iraq to the Islamic State in Iraq um, to ISIS uh, understood that there was a playbook, that its playbook was based on the teachings of Abu Bakr Neji, that it would try to create a zone, uh, what, what Neji refers to as regions of savagery where there are governance vacuums, what the US military refers to as gray zones, um, in order to create a state of conflict where uh, local, with the local jihadist movement, with local allies can build out a society that can lead to a, 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 an end state that represents what jihadist theorists are seeking. Uh, ISIS is into that phase at the moment, um, and this is going to have real implications moving forward because as the U.S. transitions into a, its stabilization mission, um, there are opportunities for ISIS to try to enact uh, Neji's strategy in, in various different ways. Um, first and foremost is how, does, how is governance done right? In that purple zone, the, that sort of periphery zone of what, would, of, of what has fallen under SDF control, the population is on the main Arab. Um, it is also on the main uh, tribal. And it also, uh, was also a real area of focus for ISIS as it began to engage in its uh, uh, what we call a bottom-up approach to build in social support for its movements. Uh, what, had, what had led partly to ISIS's uh, quick expansion and rise was it was able to sort of slap on its brand to local, predominantly Sunni armed opposition groups that had risen up against Assad, had taken control of their villages and municipalities, um, but were looking for a source of funding and arms. And ISIS, flushed from its operations in Mosul uh, and its control over oil wells and, and also its control over smuggling and trade networks into and out of uh, eastern Syria into Turkey, um, was able to provide that support. While that led to ISIS's success in the time of 2014 and early 2015, in terms of expanding its zone of control, it also led to a weakness for, for ISIS, which is when the US-led coalition came into play and exerted air power, uh, working with local, uh, local actors that had local knowledge, were able to build up a coalition of partners that could uh, take the fight to ISIS. Uh, a lot of those local sort of branded ISIS, would-be ISIS militias fled the battlefield. And you know, where we've seen the main areas of, res of resistance from ISIS in the city of Manbij, which is uh, in west of the Euphrates and the city of, Ra uh, of Raqqa, and to a smaller and lesser degree in Deir Azor uh, province in the far eastern part of the country, it has mainly been led by either local tribal groups that have been invested in the ISIS mission very early on, so by that I mean in late 2013 and 2014 prior to the fall of Mosul in June 2014, or cadres of ISIS's foreign fighters, predominantly from uh, the Caucasus um, and Central Asia, that are most committed uh, to ISIS's mission. So where we stand now, uh, as the US-led coalition tries to build up uh, stability in that periphery zone, is that ISIS, um, in, for all intents and purposes, has gone to ground 
and uh, we'll be seeking opportunities to ruin uh, the core pillars of stability that the U.S.-led coalition will try to build, which is providing security, building governance, instituting the rule of law, and uh, providing space for humanitarian assistance and local economy to be rebuilt. And this is, that will be a major focus of ISIS's efforts. Um, two, line, two tactics towards those efforts, one is to retreat into the desert, which is ISIS has done very effectively. Um, and there are zones, as you can see, uh, in Far Eastern Syria, where ISIS has sort of steppe land and sort of remote areas that are difficult for both uh, the SDF and for the Iraqi security forces uh, to patrol, and also in the core areas of the Syrian desert, where ISIS can, you know, sort of keep some of its foreign fighter battalions and some of its more committed uh, local uh, groups where it can range attacks against the Assad government, its allies, and against the U.S.-led coalition and the SDF. ISIS will all, has also tried to establish a network of operatives, um, and you know one of the, the challenges uh, it, when, we, when it comes to trying to counter ISIS in sort of the stabilization phase is that there are hundreds of thousands of internally displaced people that have fled from a conflict zones and in that entire periphery area that you see on the map um, that are now uh, in makeshift IDP camps uh, that are controlled by the SDF. Um, these areas uh, are, although there have been sort of security measures that have been tried to have been imposed, they are still uh, high, they are very easy targets. Um, it is very difficult for the SDF to vet everyone. We saw that in Raqqa, uh, where you had civilian, civilians uh, try to cross from one line, the ISIS side, to the SDF side. Uh, it was difficult uh, for, the, uh, for the SDF to know exactly uh, who locally local Syrians that supported ISIS or had adopted its mission, you know, and it, it, it's going to become a further challenge uh, that will become more stark because uh, where you have ISIS's main area of focus in terms of its proselytization mission is in far eastern Syria and Deir Ezzor governorate. Um, and just the nature of the battle there, where you had tens of thousands of IDPs flow from Deir Ezzor northward into SDF areas, uh, where a lot of those IDPs will not return to areas that are under uh, Assad's control. Uh, there is a population bulge that will occur in these refugee camps. There are international organizations that will want to provide support to those camps, as well as security guarantees from the coalition and its local partners. They are all targets, and I think it will become more difficult over time to manage that if uh, the fragmentation of Syria continues and there continues to be political uncertainty. Along with ISIS's uh, uh, attempts to infiltrate the, that zone, uh, there are also challenges when it comes to local governance that can potentially be exacerbated. Um, in that periphery zone, um, to, some, to, lesser, to one degree or to another, uh, the SDF is considered foreign. Part of that is sort of natural hostility towards sort of a Kurdish-led uh, militia organization imposing security uh, and governance. Uh, another part of that is that you know, there is, there's a great degree of uncertainty to the extent to which the U.S. will be invested in rebuilding these areas. There's uh, significant damage that has been done, uh, particularly in Raqqa, but there are other areas like, like Kobani and Mambij that still suffer uh, from insecurity due to lack of services, uh, lack of provision of infrastructure, and all of this has fallen on U.S.-backed local actors uh, to, to, to govern in that wake. I think that w when we look at how ISIS will try to influence the situation. Uh, we should also look at how ISIS will try to take operatives from Turkey. ISIS ex has built an extensive network of operatives in Turkey. Uh, they can enter Syria via the Euphrates Shield Zone. Um, and from there onwards, I think it's going to be in an interesting dynamic moving forward in these periphery zones, because this is where you really get to that brackish water point where, you know, who is going to be the long-term uh, governing authority, what is the security arrangement going to look like, and to what extent will it mobilize from locals? Which takes me to my last point, uh, that when we look at how the U.S.-led coalition is going to be responsible for stabilizing that, that, um, that periphery zone, you know, ISIS has focused its proselytizing effort on youth. It has it's put a lot of energy trying to shape the next uh, generation of the caliphate. Um, there is a. There are th hundreds of thousands of young men uh, who came of age uh, as teenagers over the course of the civil war. 
Uh, they've had the power that comes with the gun, that comes with a little bit of a salary, and the certainty that comes in uh, the ISIS indoctrination courses uh, after Assad and Assad's rule. And by and large, those are the young men that the US-led coalition will turn to at the local level in those periphery zones to build up local security forces um, in order to build a type of security. And I think we should be prepared for the challenges that come from that and the fact that it is not possible to completely and thoroughly vet um, these men. So thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Nick. Can I, uh, before we move on to Shahab, can I ask you one quick question? Um, as somebody who's only looked at ISIS from, uh, if you will, from, from afar, uh, I mean, you talked about a little bit of salary. Um, but when they had the caliphate, and you know the numbers, there was a source of income. What obviously we know is that source of income is largely gone. Um, I'm asking you to speculate about where ISIS might go in terms of its future relations with organized crime, with which you might have relations with already, or in, in which you might seek to develop them. I, I ask this question because um, Project Cassandra, I believe is the name, with Hezbollah came up again in the news lately, and which is you know, an interagency uh, effort to kind of crack down on, on Hezbollah, Hezbollah's uh, uh, financial activities, drug trafficking, and all the rest of it. What, what, any suggestions there uh, in terms of the future of ISIS potentially working, collaborating with organized crime? So that relationship uh, has been established. Uh, there's some real, there have been a number, there have been a few investigative journalists that have really tracked the ISIS smuggling networks um, out of the would-be caliphate uh, into, in particular, Turkey and then beyond. Not to say it's a Turkish network, it just happens to have to pass through it geographically. Um, the answer is yes. I mean, ISIS very, very early on uh, has sought to build networks with international smuggling chains right. into and out of Syria. And also to remember that a lot of the population of eastern Syria, particularly in Deir ez-Zor, had been engaged in what we call cross-border trade, some licit, some illicit, uh, f for decades. And so ISIS has, uh, ta has tapped into that networks. I'd also say um, one other security risk that, come, that is the confluence of what you're referring to is in that, that, that central Syrian desert zone in Homs that you saw on the map, which was in the heart of the red. Um, there, are mob, there, are nom, there are nomadic tribes that go from one end of Syria to the other that are also part of these smuggling networks, which ISIS had tried very hard uh, to build inroads into. And so that will continue to be honest. Thank you very much, Nick. Shahab, you're next. Thank you for attending. Um, my paper is going to be about um, Jordan's perception of Iran, Hezbollah, ISIS, and the Assad regime. Um, first, before I start, um, last year in December, we have lost 14 people, actually, from the security officers and civilians uh, in a terrorist attack in southern Jordan. Uh, who targeted a tourist site. Um, they, they tried to pick the right time for them, which is the worst time for us, to target um, you know, uh, civilians and security. Um, and this leads me to my paper now, which is about um, Iran, Hezbollah, ISIS, and how Jordan is affected because it's between the anvil and the hammer. Um, Jordan is a key player in the region, though it's um, been affected by, from the West by Israel. Whatever happens in the West Bank, in Palestine, in Israel, it affects badly Jordan. What happens in the North, in Syria, affects badly Jordan. What happens in Iraq affects badly Jordan. And whatever happens in Saudi, it affects badly Jordan. Whatever happens in Egypt affects badly Jordan. So we are badly affected by everybody. <laughs> um, you know, the Kingdom of Jordan, actually, it is destined by its uh, strategically located in this inferno, I would call it. Um, we try to be neutral, objective, um, with, without aligning with any 
But even though um, we have some, let's say, core regional powers that try to attract us towards them, and because of different ideologies, we cannot. That's why they try to um, harbor and plot against the kingdom. Just for those who do not know, last year we have plotted several attempts from Hezbollah in Jordan. Um, seven people were sentenced for uh, you know, uh, life imprisonment, life sentence, and some of them were sentenced to death for targeting civil targets plus military targets, including one of the airports. Um, to start with, this paper is based on my book, which is called um, Into Terrorist Minds. It was based on live interviews with scores of uh, terrorists in Syria and Iraq. Some of them Jordanians, some of them Chechens, and others. Um, you know, the kingdom has been since 1946 pro-Western. And um, the kingdom of Jordan, um, actually, it has been less beset by political violence than other countries like Lebanon or Turkey. The effectiveness of the Jordanian General Intelligence Directorate, GID, which is the country's primary uh, military intelligence service, and at identifying and neutralizing security threats is well above the regional average. And this has been um, echoed and um, resonated today by um, General McMaster. We've been cooperating with the US regarding this. Um, this has helped secure some other regional countries, including Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. So the Jordanian security has played a major role to protect the Gulf states from the threat of ISIS and other terrorist groups. For this, we are punished by others who target Jordan right now. Since the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, um, later on, the Iranian-Iraqi War in 1980 to 1988, Jordan started new strategies to deal with the regional developments which have been undergoing many political and economic transformations that drove the late King Hussein to seek balanced policies um, with the East and the West to avert the kingdom, the consequences of any miscalculations. Um, regarding Syria, we have many ups and downs in terms of our policy with Syria. Throughout the um, four last four decades, um, the um, Syrian president, Hafez Assad, was not in a good um, relationship with King um, Hussein. We have many political rifts at that time. And this continued until 2000, when his son, Bashar Assad, uh, succeeded to um, presidency, let's say. Um, there's a different ideological approach between Syria and Jordan in terms of policies and in terms of alliances. That's why Jordan has closed its borders recently with Syria. And um, as my colleague said, we have 2,600 Jordanians fighting in Syria. And these have families in Jordan. Um, this is really um, very horrible for Jordan if these return to Jordan. We have one of the two options. One of them is to um, send them to jail and it's not a solution, or to set them free, and this is not a good solution too. So how to deal with this? It is a catastrophe for us because this is, compared to our percentage, let's say 2,600 out of uh, 5 million Jordanians, it's a high rate for us. And um, they affect, because of their ideologies, their own families and their children, and these children they, um, because of the economic hardships in Jordan, they can be like a time bomb for us later on. Um, this is one of the important things. Um, regarding a public opinion poll which we conducted in the past few months in Jordan. Um, it's been conducted throughout August until September 2017. The poll showed 
on uh, 1,000 people, uh, 1,000 Jordanian adult respondents. The 98% uh, of the respondents are Muslims. 61% um, was less than a high school diploma. 55% in their age range of 18 to 34. And um, the poll shows 86% of Jordanians have a negative view of Hezbollah. And 74% uh, a negative view of the conflict in Syria. And 64% of the extremist strife in Syria. So we in Jordan a view that uh, we are bordered by good guys and bad guys, but mainly we are affected by bad guys who are affecting our economy and our politics. Um, we rated, uh, per the poll, 91% of the Syrian government as fairly negative, while 43% as very negative. And this is really uh, based on an objective poll that led decision makers in Jordan to rethink whether to open the borders with Syria right now or not. Um, the other important thing is that Jordan is geographically far away from Iran, yet we are badly affected by the Iranian uh, policies. King Abdullah of Jordan, in 2004, he was the first who warned against the so-called Shiite crescent from Tehran to the Mediterranean Sea, to Beirut. And um, until now, um, we are witnessing that the Iranians, they are on the borders with Jordan, um, southern Syria, and um, based on the escalation zone agreements with Jordan, and based on the MOC, which is the Military Operations Center in Jordan, which helps Russians, Americans, Jordanians, plus Israelis, um, they warned Iran not to keep its own forces close to Jordanian borders, which is a military threat to our security. So if there's gonna be any deal with Syria or with Iran or with any other country, these troops should be away from our borders by at least 40 miles. Um, this is what the government of Jordan wants. So, um, given Syria's historically uh, close ties to Iran and its important uh, geostrategic position on the Mediterranean, um, and including its own proximity to Hezbollah, uh, the Iranians will never give up Syria willingly. That's why Iran views outside incursions into Syria, including from Jordan's borders as unacceptable and will work to secure the border area. So um, just recently, Iranian and Hezbollah forces, they approached Jordanian borders, which forced the Jordanian armed forces last week to have some sorties inside Syria as a warning not to get close to Jordan. And Maybe you have noticed the uh, recent American announcement with Jordan to rehabilitate and restructure the uh, military airport in Northeast Jordan, which is gonna be like a logistic airport for this purpose. So now Iran for us is a major problem in Jordan, maybe in other countries like Saudi Arabia. Based on the poll, as we said, um, people view the uh, recent nuclear deal with Iran as problematic. 50% uh, of them view it as very negatively. 43% of them view it as fairly negatively. Um, 35 of them, they believe that this is a good agreement, a good deal compared with 45 who view it as bad, while 25, they have no idea whether it is good or not. But the majority view it as 
a bad one. 13% um, of Jordanians expect Arab-Iranian relations to improve, while 53% say these relations will get worse. And 29% predict they will remain about the same. Unexpectedly, six regional conflicts, including Syria, Yemen, Israel, Palestine, and ISIS, amongst Jordanians, a plurality of Jordanians say top priority should be either the conflict between Iran and Arab countries, so they give it the high priority, the Iranian-Arab conflict, rather than Arab or any country in the region with ISIS. So they give an Iranian threat as a top priority to fight. Um, in other words, we in Jordan are having like uh, uh, the tango dance with Iran. <laughs> So relations between us is like a tango, um, which requires two parties, actually, you know that. And um, why? Because Jordan's relations with the Gulf were marked by crisis or by normalization throughout history. And the second thing is that the relations between Tehran and Washington is one important factor for us. Because as a matter of principle, Jordan cannot disregard its own main allies, which is Washington, and Saudi Arabia. Yesterday, the king was in Riyadh discussing the uh, recent recognition of uh, Jerusalem as capital of Israel. Why? Because they want to calm the street down, our people. Uh, this is very important for us. Um, now, with the warning of uh, um, Jordan in the past, the king had interview with Washington Post. That was a few months ago. He also repeated his warning of a uh, kind of formation of the Shiite crescent. If this continues, there will be an opening of the borders with either Syria or Iraq. Now we opened partially borders with Iraq. And you all know that Jordan is suffering economically because of uh, the closing closure of borders with Syria and Iraq, which um, had incurred huge losses on us in Jordan, more than seven billion since the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring. So in order to study what we call it American foreign policy in the Middle East, also I would like you to um, get these points. The first one is um, Israel's security is very important for the Americans and for us, because if there is insecurity in Israel, it's going to be insecurity for Jordan as well. Um, second thing, Hezbollah, as it's a threat to Israel, it is also a threat to Jordan, because they try to destabilize Jordan in some places in northern Jordan last June 2016. Um, there was a kind of um, dirty bomb in northern Jordan which would be a catastrophic incident if it happened. Um, but the GID actually, they, they managed to handle that and we lost three officers in that. So they are trying their best to um, target Jordan in a way or another for its stance. How we view the US uh, role in the region from the general viewpoint? Um, based on the poll that I, uh, you know, um, referred to, Jordanians are mostly inclined to opt for more economic or technological assistance from the U.S., which is the 35 percent, while 33 percent believe that it is their second choice, um, which is more weapons and training for us. For the third, it is diplomatic support for Jordan and more opportunities to study, travel, or live in America are the last option, with just 13%. Um, these findings suggest that when weighing risks to Jordan's stability, it is unlikely that either Daesh or Iran and its allies could gain enough popular support to cause serious unrest. Moreover, King Abdullah's policy towards Syria seems well calculated to keep him out of trouble we don't know who's going to rule Syria tomorrow. 
That's why we are sometimes um, not speaking loudly like other countries, but we are working silently. Um, to conclude, maybe in the, in the slides you would notice there are some statistics who is um, funding and how much Iran is um, funding Hezbollah and other, um, let's say, militias in the Arab world. It um, paid its cause of billions of dollars in the past few years just to fund them. To conclude, um, the Jordanian perception of Iran, Hezbollah, ISIS, is somehow the same as they are destabilizing factors of the region. As there are Iranian troops by the borders with Jordan, the Jordanian government asked many times both Russia and the USA to keep the Iranian and its militias away from Jordanian borders to activate the, the escalation zones agreed on in Astana conference. It sounds that the Russians are now increasing their potential political and military influence in the greater Middle East region. And this affects Jordan as well. Thank you. Great. Jeff, thank you very much. Um, I, I kind of heard an answer in the last part of your um, remarks, but let me push you back a little bit on this issue of, of Iran. Um, the Islamic Republic of Iran has never wanted to be a Shia power. It has always aspired to be, as you know, an Islamic power. Now, its intervention in Syria killed that project because in the eyes of the Sunni Arab majority, Iran became this sectarian monster. Yeah. That much is good. But then we had the recent decision, and I just want you to speculate, because I know this is hard, but we had the US decision to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Yeah. The Iranians and all the other sort of radical voices in the region are gonna latch on to this. My question to you is, is Palestine, the Palestinian issue, is that gonna help Iran make inroads into the Sunni fabric of Jordanian society? Um, look, the Jordanian community, they, we are not, we are Sunni um, Muslims, mostly. 97% of the population are Muslims. Um, we believe that the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel would encourage Iran to have a bigger role amongst our communities. Um, it will start winning and gaining credibility amongst the Arabs at the expense of those who are moderate Arabs. We are not um, warmongers in Jordan, but the whole community is highly emotional. Once Trump announced that uh, decision, the, the uh, Jordanians, they um, uh, went out to the streets demonstrating, burning uh, photos of Trump, photos of uh, Netanyahu, and et cetera. And uh, just uh, today at, uh, in Istanbul, um, there was a meeting for the OIC regarding this issue. What I'm intending to say is that um, Iran will be having a major role from now until 2025 regarding the Palestinian issue. Because the Hamas, just now, they announced a cut of relations with, um, let's say, the PNA, with uh, Mahmoud Abbas, president, who tried to, um, let's say, naturalize ties between Hamas and uh, uh, Fatah. And they want to resort back to arms. And who's gonna support them with arms and weapons? It's Iran. So this kind of getting back to zero or square number one, as we were in 2006, it's the same story. So we're getting back to the same year of 2006. Now we are 2017, after 11 years, we're getting back to the same um, square, square number one. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Mitad, please. Thank you, Alex. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to be here and to present in front of such a kind of audience. And therefore, I would like to thank to Glenn and, and Jamestown Foundation uh, for, for creating a chance for myself to discuss this issue. In fact, this is one of the 
most popular issue, most probably globally, to discuss Turkey's role and position in between uh, its traditional allies in the West, mainly NATO and the US, of course. The European Union is another story for a long while for Turkey and uh, even the transatlantic, in the transatlantic relations. Uh, but the addition is, of course, Turkey's new perspective, whether there is a kind of perspective or not, the Eurasian uh, perspective, let me say. And there are many questions, in fact, rising uh, among all, the, all those traditional allies of Turkey, whether Turkey is moving towards eastward Eurasia or whatsoever. And, and what's happening in Syria and Iraq, uh, all over the Middle East, is also uh, the sign of Turkey's inclinations and Turkey's perspectives from different angles. And in his presentation, uh, Nicholas has just started to say that uh, Syria beca became both more and less complex after Raqqa. I agree with him. Uh, it is the case for Turkey as well. Raqqa made everything more complicated, and I, I put Raqqa in the title of my presentation for this reason as well. What does Raqqa mean, if, in fact, is important. Uh, the, the capture of Raqqa uh, is, is a new face in Syria and in, in the alliance, in fact, uh, for Turkey and Russia as well, uh, how to create this Astana, Sochi processes, uh, how can you brought these processes towards Geneva and is it possible to create an international alliance to resolve the Syrian issue? And for Putin, most probably, Pavel will uh, make some comments on this issue, is, is a sort of sign that mission is accomplished in, in, in Syria. This is a tough uh, narrative, in fact, to say that the mission is complete uh, in, in, or accomplished in Syria. Uh, and it seems that during his uh, visit, the President Putin's visit to Himeimim Air Base on Monday, uh, where he met with the Syrian leader Assad as well, uh, he declared once more that victory over the Islamic State is, is achieved. This is the, the perspective. And then, you, you remember, he ordered all those Russian forces and commanders. Uh, it was the time for Russian forces to be uh, pulling uh, out of Syria. This is a development and very important. Uh, in regard to that mission accomplished narrative, it, 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 I can say that now Putin wants to help broker a peace deal, uh, a sort of a honest bro broker. It's an important development as, as well. And it seems that he is keen to leverage the heightened Middle East influence that Syria has given to uh, cast himself as a leader who can do diplomacy as well as military force uh, in the region. And then uh, this is a case. Uh, for Erdogan as well, uh, as well as Americans, uh, the war against Islamic State or Daesh is also uh, over with a success. And the good news is Turkey is on the winning side for the first time. This is very important for Turkish decision makers to be in a winning side. Just remember what happened during the uh, plane incident. Uh, Turkey was searching for a support from its traditional allies and stayed out of the game and the, 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 the scene. With this uh, rapprochement with Russia, especially after coup d'etat in, in Turkey, we had a new chance uh, to be in the field. Then afterwards, it, it, it seems that with the support or with the, uh, how can I say, uh, allowance of, of, of Russians, uh, Turkey organized a, a big operation, or Operation U.S. Shields in August 2016, uh, and this was Russia's blessing. This is the case. We have to be careful. Uh, and now Turkey has a zone of control in, in Syrian territory, which means Turkey is on the field. And now with the Sochi and, and Astana processes, uh, to be in the side of winning uh, party uh, makes Turkey a, part, a, a sort of uh, actor on the field. Uh, but what are the priorities? Or Turkish government's uh, long list of Syria-related priorities. Let me give some, some of them and try to comment uh, as some bullet points in order to use my, my, my time in a better way. Uh, the re-emergence re of PYD, YPG, or PKK, 
This is the same for Turkey. There is no difference. That makes Turkish-American relations and most probably in the near future, Turkish-Russian relations a little bit sore. Uh, PKK, YPG, and PYD as an, an international actor. They are emerging as an international actor, not only region, uh, but in a global scene as well. The existence of Al-Qaeda derivatives uh, on Turkey's borders, this is an, another issue that makes Turkey a little bit hesitant whether the, the war is already win or not. This is a case, and uh, we heard many stories uh, in, in, in Spain and Portugal and some other cells, sleeping cells in all over Europe, maybe in the US, but Turkey has a long border with Syria, and this Al-Qaeda derivatives are the, the real threat for Turkey still. Uh, and the future of Sunni regions after the defeat of IS as well important. Uh, and my colleague Shahab mentioned the Shia Crescent and Turkey is uh, trying to keep itself away from this sectarian politics within the Middle East, but you have no chance at all. Then it, is, it pushes you uh, to take a uh, position and the defeat of all those Sunni groups, let's say not pro-Turkish, but controlled by Turkey is another con concern. And, and of course, the increasing legitimacy of Assad regime in Syria. It seems that Turkey is taking some steps back in, on this issue, but this is a, still an issue for Turkey. Uh, we don't know whether it's going to be an issue for the Americans and Russians, as well as Iran as well. And uh, of course, the situation of refugees. Turkey is hosting more than 3 million. And this is a big issue in Turkey. We don't know yet whether they are going to go back to their home countries or not? How can you handle with that? And it's, it's a big effort for Turkish decision makers. And then they have to think twice about the refugee issue as well. Uh, and of course, the future of the pro-Turkish or Turkey-dependent opposition in Syria. If the war is over, a new political phase just, has just started, and then what about those forces? And this is the main issue and the biggest topic that we can easily discuss uh, from this perspective. Uh, how Raqqa is, uh, has seen in Turkey? This is another question. Uh, if it is the symbol of the ending war in, in Syria, uh, or Turkish decision makers and Turkish public opinion saw the Raqqa uh, with the posters, uh, Öcalan posters, uh, handling by this PYG and uh, PYD and YPG uh, affiliates, let me say. And then there are other issues comes in front of us. And what will Turkey do in the near future to deal with this issue? Uh, for Erdogan, for example, it's clear cut. He says, we are going to move or we are going to move to fight for against terrorism to where the terrorists are located. And he says we cannot, uh, from the, I, I tried to find the word, wording or, or the speech he did. He says, let me find, uh, we cannot be expected to be under the same roof as the terrorist organization which places our national security at risk. And this defines Turkey's position. Uh, and PYD and YPG is a terrorist organization then. How to try to list this organization out of the game or the negotiation table. This narrowed down Turkey's interest and the perspective towards Syria and its relations with the US and uh, Russia as well. But on the other hand, it brings another leverage in the hand of Erdogan. Uh, he can easily use all those uh, fight against uh, the Kurdish uh, terrorist organizations or groups uh, in a domestic issue. His target is 2019 presidential elections. Then he just aligns himself with all those nationalist groups in Turkey. Domestically, he has no chance to negotiate with all those Kurdish entities uh, and the other groups. And this is a tough issue for Turkey. Uh, and we cannot expect that Turkey can uh, discuss with Russia and, of course, the US about the, the, the future of all those groups. And this is the reason why he has, Erdogan himself, has an opposition to take uh, some steps by the Russian side. And most probably this is the reason why Erdogan and, and Putin get together uh, eight times this year mm. in person. 
we cannot count the number of phone calls and all those high level leaders are getting together. And therefore, uh, it is a big issue for Russia now. Whether they may play the role of uh, the, the honest breaker in the resolution of this issue or not. It seems that Turkey is trying to play with uh, Iran and Russia in the region, but with the end of the war, the negotiation has just started. Who is gonna negotiate uh, with the Kurds and the other powers? Most probably, up to that point, Iran's and Turkey's interests are the same to control the region. Uh, we can easily follow what happened in, in uh, KRG's referendum, for example, uh, for, after, for a long while, Russia, uh, Turkey, Iran, and Iraq all get together against those uh, Kurdish uh, referendum or independence. The main priority of Turkey in, 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 in the Syrian resolution is to prevent any kind of link. Uh, that will be, or it's, if it's, it's a possibility to established by uh, the US or Russia between those different Kurdish groups. And most probably we may expect uh, Turkey's opposition more stronger, and this is the reason uh, why most of the time Erdogan reminds uh, loudly that Turkey is ready to organize another military operation towards Kurds, whether in, 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 in eastern or western side of the territory that Turkey has, is, is controlling now. Uh, I don't know whether Russia or the US let Turkey to organize such a kind of military operation, but this is the leverage in the hand of Turkey, and most probably that brings us the, the solution that the parties may long negotiate what will happen uh, in, in, in Geneva. If it's gonna be a success for the US and Russia, it makes Turkey to think twice again, and then you may follow some shift in Turkish foreign policy making in the near future. But we don't know whether Turkey uh, position itself as a constructive actor in the region or the Syrian issue or not, uh, that we have to think twice. Therefore, let me stop here, and, and I agree with Shab as well, Turkey, like Jordan, is uh, being squeezed between the American hammer and the Russian anvil at that moment. And there are big issues in Turkey, domestic and, and, uh, and regional as well. Therefore, we have to follow what will happen in the near future. Uh, and those are the bullet points. Maybe I may try to expand my arguments uh, upon the, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mitad. Um, if you could be very um, succinct, if you will, uh, in your answer. I had one question. We're running a bit out of time. Um, the argument that Turkey's uh, attempt to become a member of the European Union, going back to whatever it was, early 60s, was never serious but its position as a member state of NATO can never be questioned. In light of what you're seeing and what you said about Russian-Turkish relations, would you still agree that Turkey has no desire to question its membership in NATO anytime soon? Uh, I don't think that Turkey uh, will consider to leave NATO uh, for different reasons uh, from this Russian uh, air control or aggressive policies in the north and the south for the moment, it seems that Turkey, is, can, Turkey can easily uh, negotiate what is happening in, in all those regions, but this is, you know, uh, a sort of virtual uh, mm -hmm. rapprochement between Russia and Turkey, because, you know, uh, the targets or the, the utmost interests are not uh, identical. Turkey's interests are identical with the West. For the time being, we have some issues uh, because of this, uh, threat perception of Kurdish re-emergence or, or Kurd Kurdish uh, revival, let me say, uh, and Turkey's fixation to stick to this Kurdish issue. But you know, Russia is not a partner or, or it's not a factor that you can negotiate with in those resolutions. Uh, of course, uh, there are a couple of actors in, in NATO, in the alliance, uh, they don't like the Turkish uh, presence there, but you should remember that Turkey is an active uh, actor in all those exam uh, exercises in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea region as well. Therefore, I don't think that, including military sites and the others. This is the reason why, most probably, this Eurasianism 
stuff is very popular in, in, in Europe and the US as well, but you know, we need to think twice. And then, in short, I don't expect any move from Turkish side to leave NATO under those circumstances. Thank you, thank you, Mutat. Pavel, everybody's waiting to hear about Mr. Putin, President Putin's strategic uh, dreams about the region. Please tell us. Thank you, I'll do my best. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, as Russian military forces began to deploy in Syria in September 15, uh, many questions were asked about the true Russian objective in undertaking a new massive overseas combat mission while engaged in other conflicts and ser a serious standoff with the West over Crimea and the Donbass. With Russian budget in deficit, household income steadily decreasing, and sanctions harming the flow of capital and technologies. Ideas were pushed around in Moscow and abroad about the Syrian encounter being possibly used to deflect public opinion away from the doldrums of the seemingly unending Ukrainian crisis, or the idea was to somehow exchange Syria for Ukraine by joining the West and fighting ISIS and other jihadists, Russia could get sanctioned reprieve or maybe de facto parole for other presumed transgressions. In September 15, speaking at the UN in New York, President Vladimir Putin uh, called for the forming of a grand anti-terrorist coalition on the outlines of the Second World War anti-fascist coalition. It turned out the Russian military deployed into Syria to support uh, primarily the uh, Bashar al-Assad regime and its Iranian allies. The prime targets of the Russian campaign have been mostly the Syrian opposition fractions that were labeled terrorists, uh, though some of them most likely were. Uh, the Russian-Syrian uh, campaign did not help build up confidence between Moscow and the West, and in some cases actually created additional lines of tension. The Syrian overseas campaign was not uh, particularly popular with the Russian public. It seemed at times to be a strange, outdated, imperialistic uh, foray into the Middle East and the Mediterranean, a playground in which the Russian czars and communist leaders traditionally wrestled with, for influence uh, with Western opponents. But what was uh, the modern Putin's Russia after? In uh, February uh, uh, 07 in Munich, Putin declared the watershed change in Russian national security, defense, and foreign policy, and negating any future possibility of comprehensive strategic cooperation with the West and the United States, while retaining the option of limited collaboration on some issues like fighting terrorism. The Cold War tested strict rules of global zero-sum game became the true game rules once again in Moscow. In August 08, in the immediate aftermath of the short war with Georgia, Russia's first direct use of military power to roll back assumed Western U.S. NATO encroachment into what's considered the Kremlin security backyard. U.S. and NATO naval forces were deployed in the Black Sea, sending alarm bells ringing in Moscow. It was obvious that the dilapidated Black Sea fleet was no match. Both Moscow and Russia's second de facto capital, Sochi, where Putin stays about half of the year, were under threat of sudden uh, stealthy and massive precision cruise missile attack. As a countermeasure, a massive rearmament of the Black Sea Fleet was planned, including the establishment of a cruise missile armed attack submarine force and the introduction of new bastion long-range land-based anti-ship missiles. But the revamping of the Black Sea Fleet was considered to be not enough to build an impenetrable so uh, southwest defense perimeter. In 13, soon after the adaptation of the modern Russian main strategic top secret defense document, the plan of defense of the Russian Federation, a decision was uh, implemented to reinstate a permanent naval operational task force in the Mediterranean, with the uh, renovated Black Sea Fleet being its backbone. 
Acting in concert with the Black Sea Fleet and under the Black Sea Fleet Operational Command, the Mediterranean Squadron could help prevent a massive breakthrough of NATO naval forces into the Black Sea, as in August 08, sort of closing the straits from both sides, possibly. Uh, the takeover of Crimea in March 14 tremendously reinforced Russian control of the Black Sea, but this didn't negate the need to continue to keep and maintain a, a Mediterranean squadron. Russia still needed a per and for to have a credible naval presence in the Mediterranean, Russia absolutely needed a naval base in the Mediterranean, and it may be even more important, an air base. Uh, good and massive air base to provide the squadron with cover, air cover and support. The small, most bold Cold War time naval supply base in Tartus, Syria was increasingly dysfunctional because of the Syrian civil war. While the seemingly imminent collapse of the Bashar al-Assad regime could lead to a permanent shutdown of that base. And there's no air base in Tartus. In 15, in uh, coordination with Damascus and Tehran, the Russian military began preparations to establish a major air base in Khmeimim, close to Latak in Latakia province, Syria. In the end of September 15, the Russian military in coordination with Damascus and the Tehran led Shia militias began a major military operation in Syria that has since turned the course of the civil war there. The Tartus naval base is being expanded and reinforced. In May 17, speaking at the session of the Upper House of Parliament Federation Council in Moscow, Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu announced the main strategic accomplishment of the Russian-Syrian campaign was the, the establishment of a strong military force, Grupirovka, on the south flank of NATO, which dramatically changed the, the strategic balance of power in the region." Unquote. Uh, building a solid southwest defense perimeter in the Black Sea region and in the Caucasus against the U.S. and its allies apparently continues to be the main strategic objective. Occupying a position of overall influence in the Middle East is considered equally important, especially if this uh, undermines U.S. positions in the region in a zero-sum game terms. Moscow cannot match the United States militarily, financially, or technological capabilities in the Middle East or the Mediterranean, but it seems to be in the unique position to have workable relations with almost all the different warring parties in the region, Iran and Israel, Turkey and Egypt, Iraq, uh, the Baghdad, Damascus, uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the Kurds, different Lebanese and Libyan fractions, Algeria, Qatar, and other Gulf nations. Moscow seems to be trying to position itself as an indispensable force and middleman in the Middle East. Putin's grand uh, anti-terrorist coalition seems to be actually materializing, though on a regional level. The ultimate strategic goal would be to weaken U.S. key Middle Eastern alliances, and of course, getting Turkey possibly out of NATO or moving away from NATO would be a coveted price, a prize. A fighting Sunni jihadists in the Middle East is an important task for Russia, but clearly secondary to the overall zero-sum standoff with the United States. The Russian military command has been accusing the U.S. military of being in league with ISIS and former al-Nusra jihadists in Syria. <clears throat> it's not clear how much of that is propaganda and what is true belief that in zero-sum game terms, the enemy of my enemy, such covert interactions is something any reasonable military leader uh, would do. In any uh, case, uh, the level of uh, institutionalized mutual mistrust greatly prohibits any anti-terrorist reasonable cooperation. Moscow has a clear strategy in the Middle East, and it seems to be working not bad, though the main detractor seems to be the lack of overall resources to match its ambitious objectives. Washington, on the other hand, has abundant resources 
military and otherwise, but no obvious coherent strategy in the Middle East. It was uh, reactive under Obama and does not seem to have gotten any better since. It's a fascinating contest. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Again, Pavel, I'm sorry we're running almost out of time, but a quick question for you uh, on the topic of uh, Russian naval interests. Uh, I noticed last week that five literal states of the Caspian Sea or Caspian Lake uh, are all reporting that some sort of a deal about finally deciding the legal status of the lake is in place. The Russians apparently have forced even the Iranians to accept a, a smaller part of the lake than they would have otherwise wanted to, have been waiting for since 91. Where does the Caspian fit in? I know this is a sideshow, but I just thought since you brought up Russian naval interests generally in the neighborhood, uh, well, on the naval side, there's not much kind of real uh, co confrontation between Moscow and Tehran or ever, anyone. It's mostly about mineral rights. Yeah. Mineral rights, uh, yes, that's uh, contested. Uh, but Russia, of course, uh, dominates uh, the Caspian. There is a, some Iranian naval presence there, but it's much smaller. And uh, Russia wants to ensure that no outside powers, as it said in Moscow, will appear. There were some kind of ideas, well, there were at least, that uh, the Americans may deploy uh, somehow through Azerbaijan or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and that would be very, very unwelcome. Good. But, so, so, but that's uh, what the Caspian, I mean, militarily, it's right now more or less uh, secure. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, you've all been very patient. It's just me you're stuck with, the last guy. I'll promise to be very brief. Uh, I understand nobody really cares about Iran anyway, so why waste your time? Uh, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll be very, I mean, everyone kind of has, has a very good idea, and you heard a lot of it today, about what Iran is up to in Syria. But let me try and take you to Tehran and, and share a few, I guess, thoughts and I, I hope insights into what is making the Iranians think. I mean, I, I want to go back to basically 2011 very quickly. How did Iran's intervention in Syria begin? Why has it been successful? But where are we going to go now in this post-conflict, uh, uh, for at, at least as Iran is concerned, in Syria? And my, I guess, I mean, if there's one headline I want to put out there for you is, if from a domestic Iranian point of view, Tehran's room for maneuver in Syria is much more limited. A lot of people actually think is the case. And, and hopefully I can get to say a few words about that. But back in 2011, Iranian officials were genuinely divided in terms of what to do in Syria. If you remember, the then president, Ahmadinejad, was actually so much against it that he kind of fell out with the supreme leader, fired his minister of intelligence, then went on strike for 11 days. And it took a whole army to get him out of his uh, self-imposed uh, you know, uh, house arrest. Um, well, Syria was not the only issue, it was one of the big issues. They kind of misread, or Ahmadinejad disagreed about what Iran ought to do in Syria at the time. And in fact, so were many people in what is today the Rouhani government. Even people who were very close to the Iranian foreign minister, Javad Zarif, at the time were openly writing up at saying, our intervention in Syria is going to come back to bite us. That was their view back in 2011. And none of them, by the way, could come up with a convincing argument for why Iran ought to go to Syria, this country, you know, on the Mediterranean. It was not a traditional national security interest for the Iranians. It had always been an ideological pet project of the Islamic Republic, more than anything else. Um, they had to come up with uh, narratives to sort of sell the package. I mean, suddenly, uh, this Baathist fellow by the name of Bashar al-Assad became known as a Shia, which surprised a lot of people back in Iran. <laughs> okay. And the world media went with it, and suddenly we started reading articles about the Iranian-backed Shia Syrians. Well, this was a whole new sort of way of packaging it, but it worked. And suddenly, next thing you know, uh, Shrine of Zainab in Damascus was something that all Shias had to go and defend. This is wonderful marketing by the Islamic Republic. That's how you get Kashmiri in Pakistan, in Afghan, and our Iraqi Shias to travel all the way to, to Syria and fight for a guy who technically has never really said anything about being religious, or, 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 or Shia for that matter. But that was Iran's doing, and I think that really is, in many ways, uh, what helps the Iranians win this military battle on the, on the fields of, of uh, or in the fields in Syria, as you heard before, uh, the ground forces were basically Iranian mobilized, right? That's what keeps Assad alive. And this, in, in my view, the way I look at it, is the Iranian success story in Syria. The so-called use 
application of the so-called militia model, which is not something new for the Iranians. They have played with this model going back way to early 80s. Obviously, Hezbollah is the prime case successful one that the Iranians have put together. And they had done it again post-2000 Saddam, post-2003 in Iraq. Um, they had done that with various Iraqi groups. And Syria basically becomes a moment when this Iranian proxy model goes international. And it's no longer just the locals who Iran can get to fight, but it's actually people from third countries that are willing to fight under this Iranian leadership with sectarian messaging as, in the, as a driving force. This has been the Iranian success story in Syria the internationalization of the proxy model, and it's been wonderfully uh, executed largely thanks to the fact that the Syrian opposition has been so fragmented. So the Iranians have never had to deal with one formi formidable foe in the battlefields of Syria. For a very long time, they stayed away from eastern Syria. There was nothing to be had in eastern Syria. So they'll pick their fights very carefully. They'll pick who they fight, when they fight, and how long they fight very carefully. And that doing it that way meant this was something that they could you know, pull, pull off, frankly. I mean, after the 1979 Iranian Revolution, the Syrian conflict is Iran's second largest, by far, uh, military intervention. The first one is the Iran-Iraq War, 225,000 dead. God knows countless of billions of dollars wasted, and Iran, at the end, was able to get nothing but a ceasefire out of it. Syria has been a success story for them. They've had about 600 casualties, 600, not 225,000, uh, and, and, and they've largely fought on the cheap. I mean, I don't think anybody can say that Iran has pumped billions and billions of dollars in, into Syria every year. I'm sure it, it amounts to billions and billions of dollars in the totality of it, but I don't think this is, you know, uh, the single biggest item in the, in the fiscal year in, in Tehran. Um, so, and by the way, one other thing I think is very important to point out is, and I actually think I said it last year at the same conference, no Iranian conscript has been sent to Syria. Not one single 18-year-old Iranian conscript has been sent to fight in Syria, for good reasons. If you start selling conscripts to Syria, you've got to answer to their moms and dads back home why they're fighting. And the Syrian fight is a very difficult one to, uh, to explain to a majority of Iranian people that are anti-regime. They might be quiet, but if you start asking for the, uh, their children to die for a cause they don't believe in, that's when you get pushback. So that's why the, the proxies were also needed. But, and proxies really kick in by 2014. And here we are today with Iranian-backed or Iranian-aligned Iraq, uh, Iraqi and other Shia militiamen on the border with Israel and Golan saying, you know what, if we have to go and free Jerusalem, we'll go, we'll go there. This, this is a, uh, the effect of the rise of the militia model which has happened on the watch of the Iranians. Um, but the war is coming to an end, hopefully. And the question is, what will happen to this proxy model? I don't know. Uh, and I can tell you, I don't think the Iranians know. But they're nervous about it. I was listening to the statements by the head of the Revolutionary Guards, which is the mothership that runs all this out there in Syria and Iraq, technically the boss of uh, General Ghassan Soleimani. Um, and he said uh, in a speech uh, about two weeks ago, he said, and that, that was a direct warning just to, not just Assad, but also Putin, I think. He said, look, these, um, these militias, Mr. Assad, you owe your life and political survival to these militias. Don't forget that. And sooner you formalize them, I institutionalize them, the better. And you know, if you know the history of the Revol Revolutionary Guards, you know that's exactly what Revolutionary Guards began as. It was a, was a militia force of sorts back in 1979, and today it's this formidable state within the state in Iran. It took them about four decades to get to this point, but nonetheless, that's where they are today. And they want to do that across the board. Many Hezbollahs, as many as you can create, uh, seems to be the blueprint that the Revolutionary Guard generals believe is the way forward. They certainly don't think international negotiations and sitting down at round tables in Geneva and Astana alone is going to cut it. Uh, certainly not with some of their more stiff adversaries like the United States. So they believe the way forward is, is to have a big stick, be on the ground, and, and, and fight it out for, for influence. Um, and, and by the way, if you look at what they're doing to their armed forces, there's a whole list of restructuring going on. They're 
what used to be the American military doctrine of the 60s and 70s that the Iranians had, you know, worked with the United States during the days of the Shah to build, is very slowly disappearing now. It's much more about the so-called forward defense, hybrid warfare. It's basically guerrilla fighting, and, and they have uh, scenarios like the Syrian war in mind when they're planning for the new, next future wars in the region. And clearly they've looked at U.S. operations in the region for the last decade and a half and made their conclusions about what's the way, best way of fighting. Uh, my big question, if I was sitting in Tehran, my big question would be, at what cost is Iran willing to, I mean, how far are they willing to go to stay in Syria? And I don't know the answer to that. I think the likes of Hassan Rouhani and so-called moderates have far less appetite to invest huge in a place like Syria. I mean, just imagine for a second, once that reconstruction picks up in Syria, and it has to be done seriously, who's got the money? Certainly the Iranians don't. They just passed one of the most draconian fiscal budgets in the last 30 years since the Iran-Iraq war, just this last week. They don't have the money. They have pensioners outside the parliament every second day asking for their money. And now my, I guess what I'm sitting here thinking about this, as far as what the U.S. can do in terms of squeeze Iran in, in Syria, I think when we keep talking about the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, we got it wrong. That's the wrong focus, at least for another five years. That is working for now. Leave it. But find ways to contain Iran in the region, and the militia model is the most dangerous threat in many ways facing the United States because it's inherently anti-American. It is inherently anti-American. It, it's anti-Americanism, and it, it's in its DNA. And that's a threat that you can really point to. And as far as the Iranian government is concerned, allies like the Europeans and so on, I think have a lot of sympathy for that argument. If you listen to some of the latest speeches from the French foreign minister, the Germans, they understand that, look, maybe we can cut deals with Iran over this range of their ballistic missiles, but the militia model is basically a, to, to borrow a phrase from the great Kissinger himself, that anti-Westphalian phenomena, anti-nation anti state. And I'm, a, I'm one of those people who believes nation states still have a role to play. Uh, and you can bring a lot of order to the place if you have or, you know, nation states that function properly. If that's the way, way, that's the school of thought you subscribe to, then the proxy models that Iran has successfully used in Syria and Iraq is something that needs to be tackled. And I think it's sooner the better. And I think there will be more appetite for, for cooperation on that one issue with the United States in Europe and elsewhere, perhaps, even maybe the Russians, even, Mr. God, God forbid, Mr. Assad himself. I mean, I'm sure Mr. Assad doesn't want to have a Hezbollah-like state within a state running around in Syria as, as his rival. But anyway, these are just some thoughts from me. I know we're over time, so I, I want to open up. And, and someone smart somewhere in the back who is really in charge, tell us when we're really over time, so we'll wrap it up. But in the meantime, let's start with some questions. We have five minutes. I knew I would find a smart guy. Thank you, Wilhelm. <laughs> Um, so we have five minutes, so we can have, I don't know how many questions, but where are we going? Who's got the power with the microphone there? Oh, we... So we got one, uh, see, I, I can only tell you, oh, that lady doesn't have one. Why don't we start over there if, with, with, with the gentleman, uh, Brian. Uh, thank you for all the uh, wonderful commentaries. Uh, my question uh, goes to uh, Matet. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to speak on this issue. Uh, I'm interested in the Operation Euphrates Shield. Uh, Turks labeled the sort of paramilitaries that went in there as Free Syrian Army. And of course, uh, the U.S. sponsored Free Syrian Army around Aleppo and Idlib early on in the war. Who are these Free Syrian Army troops? You know, I've read reports that they're local Turk men from northern Syria. You know, give me some identities on them. And how long will, will Turkey remain in the sort of Mambij uh, uh, pocket there? Thank you. Uh, you know, all those groups are changing. Their, their identity and their, their position is all, has always changing. Therefore, it's not easy to define those groups. But, you know, of course, all those Turkmen brigades and other groups are still on the field. And Turkey is trying to control those groups uh, and try to establish new networks because even smaller groups changing their names and affiliation. And they try to establish some links. This is the reason why 
uh, most probably the Syrian issue is becoming more complicated and it's beyond Turkey's control as well. You remember Turkey is, has trained and equipped some different groups together with the US and with some other partners as well and failed just because of the realities of, 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 on, on the field. Uh, as far as the uh, Turkey's uh, military role or the life in Syria, it's a big question as well. This is also closely related with this Astana, Geneva, and, and of course, Sochi processes. And it seems that Turkey is trying to stay there as, la as long as uh, possible to stay there. And then this is the reason why Turkish decision makers are changing their attitude towards Damascus or Assad regime as well. It seems that uh, via Putin's uh, efforts, let me say, because he's, he sees first Assad then after Erdogan last two times, and most probably he's trying to remove Turkey's or Erdogan's uh, refusal or, or some question marks and try to find some ways. If it is the possibility, most probably Turkish uh, military would like to stay as long as uh, possible in the region. But whether it's a kind of a sort of combat capability or not, this is a big question mark. Because you know, Turkey needs whether Russian, in this case Russian most probably, or Western support to be active or engaged with all those regions. The, those de-escalation regions or, or spots is the idea, most probably Turkey tries to convince the US for a long while, then afterwards Russians led Turkey to establish those de-escalation zones, of course with an, another perspective, but you know, it is very complicated whether Turkey can survive or stay and to exert a sort of operation against those groups. Uh, and, but domestically it works. It's a sort of narrative, lip service to the public by the decision makers. He says, we can come a night or a day. You know, this was a narrative before this uh, Cyprus intervention in 1974. Therefore, it, it helps. Uh, it helps Erdogan to tell something tangible to, to, to the public in Turkey. And this is, it, it helps also to, to strengthen nationalist kind of uh, alliance within Turkish domestic politics as well. Therefore, this is a little complicated, but this is the case, I think. Thank you, Mitad. I think we have one final question. Number table number four, please, if we could get the microphone over. Thank you. All right, this question is from Mr. Felgenhauer. Uh, with Russia's seemingly, well, their position right now publicly has been uh, anti-terror, especially in Syria, fighting against ISIS. That's what the Kremlin has led people to believe. However, to what extent is their ignorance or their ignoring of uh, terrorist affiliates in, say, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan and Chechnya going to affect their long-term regional goals in the long run? Thank you for that question, Pavel. Thank you. Uh, uh, the Russian policy was an actual practice right now in Syria too, is that um, they are offering in the kind of trying to use the Chechen uh, model of uh, 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 pacification. And that has been just recently publicly acknowledged by General Vladimir Shamanov, who was a uh, leading uh, general in the Second Chechen War, now is chairman of the uh, Duma uh, Defense Committee. Uh, that uh, specialists with experience in Chechnya are working with different groups in Syria. And uh, I have kind of heard from groups in Syria that yes, they're working with them, offering different kind of uh, things, basically that you'll be good if you agree, if you sign up uh, for the kind of deconflictization and basically accept uh, the, uh, the Damascus regime in some kind of form, and you're going to have some kind of role. And then you'll not be terrorist. And if you don't, you'll be terrorist and you'll be bombed. <laughs> uh, so that's how it kind of works. And that has been the attitude of the, the Russian military. I mean, it worked in Chechnya. We got those kind of Kadyrov terrorists who were separatists and fighters, and then they changed code. So trying to change code is the main way Russia is trying to deal with the terrorist threat, create 
It's, it's something like, you know, this awakening that the Americans did in Iraq, but then abandoned it in the middle. Russia is trying not to abandon, but to be consistent in uh, cr creating different kind of groups with uh, connections to Russia because um, having only Iranian with foot soldiers in Syria is not it's considered a very good option. Having some kind, and Russia does not want to be seen as kind of very partisan fraction on the side of the Shias in the Middle East. Mm. Russia is doing its best to spread out and be good with all and with Sunnis too. So it's important to have um, the Sunni uh, kind of local foot soldiers or uh, allies, and, those, and you better get, get, take those who already have combat experience, who are the kind of bad guys, but you turn them into good ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pavel. I hope you enjoyed this panel. Uh, if you could be so kind and join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're going to try and get started. Um, welcome to our third panel session of the day. My name is Alexander Samer, and I'm the editor of the Jamestown Terrorism Monitor. Uh, there's an issue, uh, the, the most recent issue of the Terrorism Monitor, in your packs. Um, and I obviously encourage you to read it. You can visit the Jamestown website um, and uh, do sign up for that. This, uh, the, the, the previous panel focused on the Middle East, and we're going to move the focus um, geographically slightly. This afternoon, we're looking at trend lines in militant movements and going to try and look a bit at perhaps what we can expect in 2018. And I'm, uh, I'm joined uh, here by three experts, all of whom I'm, I'm very pleased to say have written for the Terrorism Monitor. Um, so let me quickly introduce our panel. Um, we've got uh, Jacob Zen, who is a, a fellow of African Eurasian Affairs with the Jamestown Foundation. He's regularly cited by the BBC, the Washington Post, CNN, and the New York Times. He's also an adjunct professor teaching a course on nonviolent state actors at Georgetown University. Uh, I think that's probably the, the courses at Georgetown, not the violent non-state actors. Um, we have Dario, Dario Cristiani. Uh, he's an adjunct professor in international affairs and conflict studies and the director of executive training in global risk analysis and crisis management at Vesalius College in Brussels. Uh, he holds a PhD in Middle East and Mediterranean studies from King's College in London. Um, and on the end, uh, Abu Bakr Sadiq, who's a journalist with Radio Free Europe. He also edits the Gandara website, which provides reporting and analysis, uh, reporting and analysis on Afghanistan and Pakistan. And he's the author of an excellent book on the Afghan conflict that's titled The Pashtun Question, The Unresolved Key to the Future of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, I'm sorry I've rushed through that very quickly because we're getting, um, we're, we're, we're quite tight on time. I've asked each of the speakers to speak for 10 to 15 minutes, certainly no longer, and I'm gonna enforce that, and that, that way hopefully we'll have some time for questions uh, from the floor afterwards before we have to, uh, to bring that to an end. So uh, I'm just gonna hand over now to Jacob. Thank you very much. I'll be speaking on militant movements in Nigeria and the Sahel. I'll, I'll start off by saying that from an academic perspective, there have been a lot of uh, key resources that have come out in the past year and a half uh, to understand uh, the relationship between AQIM and Boko Haram. Uh, to give an example of some of these resources, one is a 67-page document that AQIM released detailing its communications with Boko Haram leaders from 2009 to 2010. That's the period when Boko Haram declared a jihad and started the insurgency. Uh, another key uh, documents have been some uh, biographies and eulogies that some AQIM leaders have uh, published about uh, members that died as, uh, late as, uh, as, as, uh, in 2002. And uh, these members that died in 2002 had been in Nigeria and had cultivated some of the roots of what became Boko Haram. And uh, third, there was a um, conviction of a Nigerian Al-Qaeda member in New York in March 2017. And some of the exhibits and his uh, court transcript reveal that he was sent to Nigeria by Al-Qaeda External Operations Union in 2003. And this is the clearest um, Com communications and uh, attempts to carry out attacks between Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda central leadership that, that we've ever seen. So we have a lot of new knowledge on the group uh, in recent years. And this uh, Al-Qaeda origin uh, to Boko Haram when the group formed in 2002 is important to understanding the faction ISWAP, 
which stands for Islamic State West Africa Province, because the leaders of Islamic State West Africa Province are the progeny of the original Al-Qaeda uh, activities in Nigeria. Although they're loyal now to Islamic State, the leaders of ISWAP are the ones who are internationally experienced. Uh, they are the ones who are more sophisticated in terms of their terrorist tactics than the other faction, which is the one we know of as Boko Haram, or BH, whose real name is Jamaat Ahl Sunnah Lidawa Wal Jihad, uh, but commonly known as Boko Haram, which means Western education is sinful as a sort of slander against the movement by the government and the media. Boko Haram is becoming increasingly irrelevant. If you are familiar with the armed Islamic group or the GIA, the predecessors to AQAM, in these 67 page documents that I just mentioned, one of the um, le leaders of Boko Haram in 2009 writes about the current leader of Boko Haram, Abu Bakr Shakao, saying that he would have been a top student of the GIA if he was in Algeria then. And not only that, he would have been the, the valedictorian. Uh, so, um, so Boko Haram is just killing too many people. It's aggra aggra aggravating the citizens too much. And the leader Shakao is too much of a megalomaniac uh, to, to lead an effective movement. And that is just making ISWAP increasingly uh, influential in the insurgency and what we knew of as Boko Haram I think will move to fade out. Then there's also this Ansaru faction which stands for Ansar al-Muslimin fi Bilad sudan which is the supporters of Muslims in black Africa. Ansaru is basically operationally dormant now but it is uh, significant because it comprised many of the members of Al-Qaeda or AQIM who were Nigerians and they were very active in the suicide bombing spree in Nigeria in 2011, 2012, when 36 suicide bombings took place in an 18 month period in a country that had never seen suicide bombings before, including the UN Federal Police Headquarters. And they were involved in kidnapping 11 foreigners in uh, Nigeria in that time, uh, 10 of whom were killed. Uh, the key Ansaru members have joined with Islamic State West Africa province, meaning that Ansaru is not very uh, important right now, but some of its members do linger on, and it's sort of some X factor. So when you look at uh, potential future linkages between Boko Haram and groups in Mali, considering Ansaru has its lineage in AQIM, even though its key members are now with Islamic State, it's a potential connector group, so it's worth uh, looking at. Um, if, you're, if you're collecting data on the insurgency in Nigeria, you'll probably find that in the past year or two, uh, you know, various conflict indicators are down, such as uh, people killed, households destroyed, everything from rape to slavery. Um, but that's because in 2013, we saw Boko Haram conquest. In 2015, we saw a big army offensive against Boko Haram. Now we're not really in a phase of any key offensives by either side. Uh, so we're at a status quo that's, that's not a, a great situation for Nigeria in my viewpoint, but we're not seeing any huge uh, tide turning going on. Um, so just because, however, but just because you see lower conflict indicators, it doesn't mean that the situation is getting better. Um, because ISWAP still is active in a very large amount of territory uh, in northeastern Nigeria, which I'll show you on the next slide. Currently, uh, there's not really a far enemy project by ISWAP, which is the more powerful faction. And that means that they're not targeting foreigners like the uh, Al-Qaeda Nigerian, Al-Qaeda Boko Haram members did in 2011, 2012. And I think there's a, a pretty basic reason for that. These groups in Nigeria, they're not inherently uh, designed or inclined to attack foreigners and foreign interests. If you look at 2003 period and then the 2011, 2012 period, when the objective was to hit foreign targets, it was because you had Al-Qaeda behind them, urging them, training them, and financing to do, do so. Now Al-Qaeda is out of the picture in Nigeria because ISWAP is strengthened and Ansaru is weakened. Um, and uh, Islamic State is currently on the run and there's really no evidence that Islamic State has given orders to uh, ISWAP to target foreign uh, interests. So without any sort of mastermind behind them telling them to attack foreigners, they seem pretty content achieving one of their original goals, which was to push out the Nigerian government from territory and to be the de facto rulers. And that's the state we see in northeastern Nigeria now. What could lead to foreign enemy attacks is uh, precisely the inverse of what I just said. Uh, one is Al-Qaeda getting involved in Nigeria again, which is possible, and I'll discuss that, and urging some attacks on foreign targets like a cafe or a hotel, similar to what we've seen in uh, Ivory Coast or uh, Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, or uh, Bamako, perhaps just to show that Al-Qaeda has a presence. 
that th they don't have a presence right now, but that, that is an indicator of something we could see. Or Islamic State uh, communicating with ISWAP again and telling ISWAP that you need to step it up and you know, make the world focus on you, especially while we're on the run. Um, however, I, I do think some of the uh, lines of communication between ISWAP and Islamic State fell apart, in part because some Sudanese intermediaries and the Tunisian Libyan based intermediaries uh, between Islamic State core and ISWAP uh, have basically been killed or disappeared. Let me take a closer look at ISWAP because this is the more important faction in uh, Nigeria right now. The leader is Abu Musa Balbarnawi. He's sort of like the Hamza bin Laden of, of ISWAP in the sense that he is the son of the leader of the movement from 2004 to 2009. He doesn't show his face. Uh, he's, he's sort of calm and collected. Um, unlike Hamza, he does have battlefield experience. In fact, he was uh, raised by Abu Bakr Shakao, the current Boko Haram leader, after his father was killed by uh, the Nigerian security forces. Um, and, and he just keeps a very sort of low profile, but he's quite articulate. And one of the things he's been doing, and that I've been tracking on uh, the Telegram application, and that's written somewhat in my terrorism monitor piece, is that he interprets Islamic State sermons and Islamic State articles for local audiences in his territories in northeastern Nigeria. And he always sides with the official Islamic State positions, but he's extremely loyal to Islamic State right now. And uh, he's very young, and uh, he's a leader that has the potential to be around for, for decades more. Um, and he is incul inculcated in the Al-Qaeda methods in the way that he wages insurgency. Uh, if you've studied Al-Qaeda over the years, you've found that Al-Qaeda has tried to learn to engage in population-centric insurgency strategies. We've seen this in Yemen, we've seen this in uh, Tunisia, and a number of theaters. And he is trying to uh, focus on uh, being uh, gentle, certainly compared to the other factions, to the population, being very clear to them that as long as you don't collaborate with the government, we won't kill you for no reason whatsoever, and we won't even target Christians just for being Christians. Um, and we won't even target Muslims just for participating in an election. This is very different from the other Boko Haram faction that I say is fading out that will kill you just like the GIA did in Algeria for just not joining their movement, whether you're Muslim or Christian. They've raised uh, money from uh, taxing the fishermen trade around the Lake Chad region. That's a local source of funding. Um, and although, uh, as my Nigerian colleague pointed out to me today, it wouldn't be right to say that they control territory or hold territory in a Islamic State sense, what we saw in Syria, but uh, they do focus a lot on securing the logistics routes and the roads to make it very hard for Nigeria to access the territories uh, where ISWAP is now, which according to that map is mostly uh, the, on the upper side of that diagonal line. And uh, so are they really administering it? Not quite, like we saw with Islamic State in Syria, um, but they can keep the Nigerian government out, to say the least, and that's by uh, uh, securing logistics routes. Um, the propaganda, as I mentioned, um, is, is the Islamic State system. They use the Islamic State formats. Um, they release it through Islamic State. But they, they're very stealthy in that they don't release their, uh, their faces. And this is part of a learning experience that they've had, where in 2003 and 2009, they moved above ground and Nigeria cracked down upon them. So it's sort of in their DNA to try to be mysterious. The real mastermind behind ISWAP is actually Mama Noor who used to be the third in command behind Shikau, who was the second in command in 2009. Noor, I believe, is based in Sudan or has been based there. And he's never shown his face since 2009. You can't really pinpoint where he is. Um, but I do think he's uh, very influential, not only ideologically, and there have been some leaked audios from him in recent years, um, but also uh, for financing reasons. And it's very hard to pinpoint Boko Haram financing. But uh, you might look to places like Senegal, where I think there have been accurate reports of them investing in, say, land or in uh, South Africa with the diamond trade that can run through, uh, run through Sudan, or even a counterfeit a currency or a currency exchange from South Africa through Sudan, through Mama Noor. I mean, this is some of the stuff I'm trying to track, and it um, even originated from the key negotiator for Boko Haram, who was a Cameroonian, who was mysteriously released from Cameroonian, Cameroonian prison a few months ago and now has gone to South Africa. So I mean, these links are very hard to find, but I think it's a continental effort, and Mama Noor is likely the head behind it. Um, despite that, uh, Islamic State in Syria was much more brutal than what we see ISWAP doing. That might be partly circumstantial. ISWAP is completely committed to the Islamic State uh, brand and the Islamic State agenda and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, in, in fact, Shakao, who has been kicked out of ISWAP and is now leading the Boko Haram, which is not part of Islamic State, uh, Shakao actually still believes that Baghdadi is the caliph. So there's a lot of um, ideological belief in Islamic State, and that should give uh, ISWAP 
I mean, Islamic State, a lot of influence in Nigeria for years to come. There's no sign that despite Islamic State struggles that they're leaning to Al-Qaeda at this point of time. Uh, are Nigeria U.S. up to the task? Um, I would say that I think analytically the U.S. Has, has done a good job recognizing that ISWAP is definitely the future of the insurgency in Nigeria. And I think from speaking to U.S. Um, analysts and USAID, they understand that it's very problematic uh, right now in the Northeast to kick out Boko Haram or kick out ISWAP because ISWAP is much more neutral to the population. It makes it harder to win back the population when there's an, uh, a more gentle uh, insurgent group controlling uh, at least the northern part of Borno State. Um, Nigeria, I, I think, is facing just a very typical counterinsurgency dilemma. I think they can control the towns, but I don't think that they have the uh, manpower on the ground to, to win back the territories and make it so that uh, ISWAP, at least, cannot den deny them access. And I, I don't see any, um, any of that changing because Nigeria has invested so much in retaking territory since 2015, and where we stand now, they're not very close to being able to make a situation where ISWAP can't deny them access. If we turn um, to Mali and the Sahel situation, I think the biggest thing to notice is that the opening of new fronts. Here we're talking about Burkina Faso, which the northern part of the country is getting hit with many attacks uh, by a group uh, with an ideology similar to Boko Haram, really targeting schools, Western education. Uh, Niger is getting hit hard too. If you look at that upper map, the thing about Niger, it's really a spillover actually from Mali and Burkina. But if you look at Africa, you're also seeing new fronts open in Congo. And this is a trend where we see Muslim movements um, turn to Islamist movements, turn to jihadist movements. And, and that's what we're seeing in Congo. And I wouldn't be surprised if that trend continues uh, to other parts of Africa that have a Muslim population. And I attribute that to uh, something I call the Salafization of Sufi jihads where in the past it was Sufi jihadist groups that had uh, done, that had ruled 200 years ago in the pre-colonial era. But with the continued Salafi propagation, the uh, Sufi narratives are now becoming almost as if it was Salafis who used to be the jihadists in the region. And I think it's making a very fertile uh, psychological terrain for jihadist groups to, uh, to cultivate. And that's something that McMaster talked about earlier today. I would also uh, mention that as groups in the Sahel move further from Algeria, from AQAM core, they tend to move farther from uh, Al-Qaeda's orbit. Ansar was a group in Nigeria that was AQAM that ended up joining Boko Haram and is now leading ISWIP. Abu Walid al-Sahrawi, he uh, is uh, indicated in the attack on U.S. Special Forces. He was sort of the furthest extent of AQIM. Now he's sort of with the Islamic State, but loosely. Ansar al-Islam, the group in northern Burkina Faso, is the furthest extent of the AQIM movements, and it's also moved away from AQIM and sort of been independent. Um, and I would say that in uh, the attack on the U.S. Special Forces in Niger, we see these groups that are straying very far from AQIM, and that's why they're not really Al-Qaeda groups. They lean towards Islamic State, but they're not really Islamic State. And they're largely independent um, roamers, and they don't really have a clear ideological affiliation. And that might be also why they have chosen to be very silent about that attack, and nobody's claimed it. The future CT operations that we see in uh, West Africa are going to be U.S. manning up uh, drone operations. Uh, to study what will happen, you can probably look at what happened when the U.S. droned in other places, if the U.S. actually starts carrying out attacks. And it hasn't been largely successful, and these groups are more resilient than their leaders. Finally, uh, if I looked at futures, I would say that uh, there's always been talk of this arc connecting uh, Niger and uh, Mali to Nigeria and the arc in the Sahel. It hasn't happened yet, but it might be getting closer. And as we find out more information on the attack on U.S. Special Forces in Niger, we might find that you perhaps had some Nigerians that, uh, involved, and as the spillover moves into Niger, we might start seeing the operational area of Boko Haram, ISWAP, merge with Mali, and then that arc will begin to appear. And Niger is really the key geopolitical linchpin keeping the arc from not happening. Second, uh, as I mentioned this, with this attack on the special forces in Niger, these groups weren't really AQ, they weren't really IS, their loyalties were loose, and they're sort of in-betweeners. And I think we're seeing a, um, a lot more in-betweeners as groups have continually moved down from the Algeria space further into the Sahel, something that Dario uh, Christianity is researching and writing about uh, elsewhere. Um, finally, I just want to point out, if you look back and see what people wrote about Nigeria in 2007, they called what became Boko Haram a moderate revivalist movement, 
uh, Islamist, Islamism was innocuous, and it's completely different from what we see today. So when I talk about um, new fronts opening up and uh, people saying, you know, probably won't happen in Congo, not the Kenyan coast, um, you know, not Senegal, if you look back at what people were in 2007 compared to what we see in 2017, if that difference is what we see in 2027, places like Senegal will also become under the heat as well. So we, we should have some level of alarmism and pay a lot of attention to this. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I will try to be uh, short and, and sweet. First of all, uh, thank you for having me here today. It was a bit of a complex journey uh, from Europe because of uh, uh, weather uh, issues. So uh, I will try to uh, talk for the next 10 minutes about the reorganization of Islamist movements in, uh, in North Africa. Uh, the title uh, actually um, refers to Islamist movements in general, but the focus will be much, much narrower uh, because I will be talking specifically on jihadi organizations moving around um, Libya, uh, namely. So um, let's talk about the context first. Um, in North Africa now there is a feeling of, uh, let's say, disillusion. Uh, for what the Arab, the Arab Spring could have been and has not been. Um, I work in Brussels three months a year, but for professional and private re um, and personal reasons, I live in Tunis the rest of the year. And I can tell you that the feeling in Tunisia, uh, in uh, uh, the country that started uh, actually the Arab Spring Revolution, is, is a feeling of, uh, you know, Many people say in many cases, but maybe it was better before, at least there was security, at least we could go out without fearing uh, crime, etc., and so on and so forth. And this is like uh, a comment that many uh, also in Libya, like Tunis is full of Libyans at the moment, say about uh, the situation in Libya before the beginning of the Arab Spring. Uh, through the entire region, there, is a there are a number of issues, in many cases associated with, uh, with the economic problems. Uh, in Tunisia, there is the return of all the cleavages between the Beldi and the Saheli, but also between the coast and interior region. Libya, and this will be the focus of this presentation, is very much characterized by an ongoing process of increasing fragmentation and economic collapse associated to the political use of, of the territory that many militias um, uh, have carried out over the past few years in order to push forward their own agenda at the expenses of oil production. Uh, we can talk about Al Jadran, but also many other groups. Uh, then Algeria. Algeria is going through a very complex transitional phase. Next year there will be the elections in May 2019, uh, and uh, no one still knows whether President Bouteflika has the intention to participate in these elections again. And then Morocco, which normally in the Western like um, narrative seems to be the most stable country, there also has a number of problems in the Reef region, but also, as we have seen in the case of the attacks in Spain, with the presence of uh, isolated cells associated with uh, Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State operating with groups uh, in Europe. Um, as I said, Libya. Libya was essential for the emergence of the Islamic State as a, reg as, as a wider regional and global uh, threat. Because at some point, Islamic State fighters were invited to move to Libya rather than uh, in Iraq and Syria. And now that the caliphate is under um, military pressure in Iraq and Syria, this movement is even more significant. Um, as I said, um, the focus will be on Libya because uh, we said clearly this morning that groups like Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb or the Islamic State, Daesh, whatever you want to call it, um, they still need safe heavens. I know it sounds a bit of an old-fashioned idea in the era of the internet, but territory is still very important for this organization especially. And we can see that in terms of the geostrategic environment, 
there is now two main centers of, um, let's say, in which these groups um, can find the possibility for them to carry out their own uh, terrorist activities, but also like economic activities associated in many cases with contraband. It's southern Libya and northern Mali that we can consider the centers. Then there is the southern part of Algeria and the northern part of Niger, which represent the corridors for these movements, uh, to, for these people to move around the region. And then there are Tunisia, Morocco, and Mauritania, which represent the appendixes of, of this wider theater. Um, when talking about Libya, as I said before, um, after uh, the Arab, the, the 17th of February uh, revolution and the killing of Gaddafi on uh, the 20th of October 2011, for one year, let's say, there was like some sort of optimism, particularly if you were speaking with Libyans at the time. Then the situation started uh, to collapse, which is very common, uh, I would say. I was expecting something like this because Libyans, in many cases, they tend to cooperate only wh when there is a significant like common external threat. As an Italian studying history, I know this pretty well. Uh, it, this was the case of, of Gaddafi in 2012. Then, after the, let's say, um, Libyans lost uh, the momentum after the elections in July 2012, and from 2014, the situation started to, to collapse openly with, uh, with the launch of Operation Dignity or, and Operation Down, and the emergence of the current political situation in which there are de facto three governments, uh, also the general nation, the, the government of the national accord led by um, al-Saraj, de facto represent just another militia, or not militia, like another like player uh, without real control on the entire country. And we have seen the forces of uh, General Haftar to become even more significant in the wider strategic context of, of Libya. And um, in this context, the Islamic State tried to um, um, tried to do exactly what they have done in Iraq and Syria, using the phase of political chaos in order to establish a presence. They tried to do so in Derna and Benghazi first, but they failed because, and this is an element that I suspect they underestimated, Libyans don't really like foreigners to tell them what to do. Also in the case of jihadists, Forces. So, because the Islamic State had this tendency to impose a vertical control, bringing uh, leaders from Iraq and Syria into the new provinces, telling the local actors what to do and how to behave, the local jihadi forces uh, worked in many cases with uh, some of their enemies in order to have these groups um, these, these fighters leaving their own cities. And in the case of Derna, it's particularly significant because Derna for decades was considered to be, um, you know, the center of radical jihad Salafism in, in, uh, in, uh, in Libya. When talking, this morning we were talking about the old Libyan Qaedis fighters uh, fighting in Afghanistan. Many of them were from Derna, for instance. Uh, then, the Islamic State found a possibility to emerge in Sirte. Sirte has a very specific history, uh, being possibly the city that benefited the most from uh, the period of Gaddafi in power, because that was the city where Gaddafi's tribe, uh, where Gaddafi was born and Gaddafi's tribe uh, used to live. And Gaddafi's tribe was not actually one of the most important in Libya before the revolution of 1969. There were rumors that they arrived in, in Sirte with the support of some uh, old uh, members of the regime. Like there were, there was some evidence at some point, although I wouldn't consider that as the most important factor explaining why the Islamic State arrived in, uh, <coughs> in Libya. And in the very beginning, no one wanted uh, to take the burden of fighting them. I'd, I, I have some friends from Misurata and one of the comment of the comments I heard at the time was people in Sirte, they deserve 
to be under the control of the Islamic State because there is a very significant history of urban rivalries in, uh, in Libya, but when the situation was clearly out of control for, uh, um, when it was clear that the Islamic State had a chance to strengthen its presence, uh, Misratan forces joined by the support of uh, a number of external actors, the United States, but also other European countries, they work to kick out of Sirte uh, the Islamic State fighters. And uh, this would be the focus of my last two slides. Um, in North Africa now there are a number of groups that are, at some point they were competing um, among each other, but now there is a process of, I wouldn't say reconciliation, but of convergence, let's put it this way. Of course, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, despite everything, still represents the most important regional actor in the wider jihadi uh, movement. Then there is this brand, well, brand new movement created uh, early this year, Jamat Nusrat al-Islam wa al-Muslimin, which is a group bringing together five different organizations linked to Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, and it operates in northern Mali and is led by Yad al-Ghali, who is the leader of Ansar al um, Then we have the Islamic State in Libya that, despite um, the defeat in Sirte, uh, it's still present, and I will explain later on how they have reorganized themselves. Then the Islamic State in the Sahara, in the person of Adnan al-Sarawi, um, the Islamic State in the Sahara is a bit of more like, uh, it's a bit unclear how they are organized, but it's, um, it, it's, it, it's present and uh, to a certain extent is using um, the resentment of local, for instance, shepherds or uh, other like people who were absolutely um, not part of the jihadi world uh, against a number of dynamics occurring in the region to use this rage against the local governments but also against the so-called far enemies. Then we have the Libyan bloc with a number of organizations, the Benghazi Revolutionary Shura Council, the Derna Revolutionary Shura Council, and although it has been officially dismantled in, uh, in May this year, Ansar al-Sharia elements are still present in, in Libya. And then there is a, smaller, a small movement in Tunisia, Okba Binafe, which is still very active. This is something that English-speaking newspapers don't really report about, but during the summer, the Tunisian security services have carried out an, a very significant number of operations in the south, uh, southern regions and at the border with Algeria, arresting a number of groups associated with this Qaeda's offshot in Libya. So to conclude, in the post daesh environment in North Africa, there will be an attempt between the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda to mend the ties. Uh, from this point of view, and I have to say that a number of wider dynamic occurring at the moment can help this kind of uh, convergence, like the issue of Jerusalem, for instance, it's a huge propaganda tool for this organization to find like a common ground to talk again uh, among themselves, and of course, let's be very clear, these groups were like, at some point were divided, but they were the, the sons of the same father, let's say, and in, it, in Italian we have an expression, compagni che sbagliano, which was used by the Communist Party towards the Red Brigades. It translates as comrades who make mistakes. This could be the case for some Islamic State fighters in the eyes of Qaedis groups. Uh, the Islamic State in Libya is still there. Just it has reorganized itself in a more like uh, uh, mobile fashion. Um, it's not very much the first, like um, the top, um, like the leadership which is organizing itself, but it's the middle rank of fighters, in many cases French-speaking fighters coming from West Africa, that are now dispersed in the south of Libya, in Ubari, near Saba, and in a couple of small towns around Sirte. The fact that the Islamic State was kicked out of Sirte doesn't mean that it doesn't represent a threat anymore. 
on, on the contrary, the fact that they reacquire tactical mobility, this is a very important element for them to carry out operations in, um, and in the past few months we have seen something like this already happening in Libya, for instance, the attack against the Justice Palace, the, the Justice Court in Misrata, but also a number of attacks against the checkpoints of the forces of Khalifa Haftar. Um, then some elements of uh, uh, Ansar al-Sharia in Libya who, were, who moved towards uh, the Islamic State in 2014 when they were under the military pressure of Khalifa Haftar, they are returning uh, towards al-Qaeda. And from this point of view, it's very likely that if they won't return fighting under the same banner, at the same time there would be some sort of uh, tactical convergence, which is a bit particular for a group which has the same like strategic aim. So this convergence could be also on a more strategic level. And then with, um, with the emergence of a new leadership in the Islamic State, like the one of uh, Mohammed Ben Salem al Ayuni, which is a French Tunisian, like he has a double passport. It's, he's a foreign fighter who went fighting in Iraq and Syria, but now he seems to be one of the rising stars within the Islamic State and is considered to be very close to Qaeda's elements. And he's one of the key leaders promoting reconciliation between do, these two organizations. So I will stop here. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer here. Or I will be here in DC until Monday. So just in case, if you want to see me outside of here, thank you very much for listening. Well, uh, thank you, Jamestown, for inviting me to speak here for the second time. Um, I have to uh, have a short disclaimer. Uh, the views uh, here express, uh, that I express are not those of my employer. These, these are primarily based on my own research and following the Taliban for years now. Um, Taliban is different. They are not an emerging threat. They've been around for a quarter century as an organization. Uh, and even longer if you consider that they were Taliban fronts in the anti-Soviet Mujahideen uh, in 1980s. Um, so to understand Taliban today, um, there are three main perspectives. I've deliberately left out one perspective which claims that they are some kind of Afghan or Pashtun nationalists. Um, they are an Islamist organization um, and by their own account, and uh, a lot of people, uh, scholars who study them, or if you read their literature, they keep on referring to recreating their Islamic emirate, this Taliban regime in the 1990s, that basically by the end, uh, by its end in 1995, was ruling, controlling 95% uh, of the Afghan territory. Um, to others, uh, particularly after 9-11, uh, or even before 9-11, because they were under UN sanctions. Uh, uh, they are part of a global si uh, syndicate that is not directly involved in terrorism because the Taliban, Afghan Taliban organization we are talking about, uh, the, the, that calls itself the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, uh, was, has not uh, claimed uh, credit for attacks in any mas uh, major Western city. Their literature is very keen on repeating that uh, their aim are limited to the borders of Afghanistan uh, as recognized by the United Nations. That when I was researching my book, I met a lot of former Taliban and um, had a way to send in questions to current members of the Taliban and their people. There is a whole commission that they have, the political commission, there's the media commission that you can talk to, to understand Taliban positions. And then now they have an office in Qatar where a lot of the current understanding of the Taliban comes from people reaching out to uh, these people, like 12, 15 members of the Taliban. Um, and they, um, a lot of these people, uh, they have always denied that they are a part of Al-Qaeda. In fact, they, uh, one, the former foreign minister of the Taliban, Mr. Mutawakkil, who lives in Kabul now, 
as a private citizen. He told me that uh, they, the Taliban, in fact, inherited Al Qaeda in 1996 when they captured the eastern city of Jalalabad because bin Laden had moved a few months before the Taliban captured the town. And then one of the uh, perspectives that's not talked about the, about the Taliban a lot in the West or has not been uh, talked about is that this perspective in Afghanistan and Pakistan, primarily among Pashtuns, but also among the Afghan elites, um, and opposed to the Taliban, of course, that pa Taliban are nothing more than uh, proxies of Pakistan, and their main, main aim is to dismantle the Afghan state and society, um, and, and that they are just a war machine uh, that, that uses asymmetrical uh, welfare uh, to further or advance uh, whatever Pakistan's ultimate objectives are, which is to have a client regime or a very weak neighbor that's unable to create a modern state that has been uh, the driving force be behind Afghan nationalism, uh, Pashtun nationalism for most of 20th century to have a modern nation state. And then, of course, uh, this people believe that uh, although the Taliban are not directly involved in international terrorism today, they have an enduring relationship in international terrorist networks. Uh, and that's why a lot of these groups um, uh, still find space to operate in Taliban-controlled areas in Afghanistan. One good example is the Pakistani Taliban. Ironically, for Pakistan, Pakistan supports or at least turns a blind eye to Taliban sanctuaries on its soil, and then it complains uh, that Afghanistan is sheltering all uh, these Pakistani Taliban who, in fact, live in areas that are controlled by Afghan Taliban. Uh, so um, what do the Taliban want? I mean, you can put it on paper. The Taliban uh, still are committed to a uh, Sharia unitary state. They, have, they are against federalism, any kind of federal arrangement, like many Afghan political groups. Um, and of course, they are an Afghan Islamist group that is limited to Afghanistan that has no ambition to, for example, impose it uh, Khilafat in Central Asia or even in Pakistan or in, South, in, in, in Iran or something. Um, they are, uh, there is a lot of talk about and some new research about Taliban um, uh, trying to, uh, uh, willing to agree to some kind of a tweaked version of emirate or a compromise. For example, the Taliban, a lot of these Taliban political types in Qatar and, and people who are, who are willing to talk to researchers and journalists, they are now putting out this idea that they will no longer impose the harsh punishment, there will be no longer this uh, Amr bil Mahroof, Nahi al Mulkar, this morality police uh, in the new uh, Taliban, and, and they have stopped uh, bombing uh, the schools for some years now, uh, although there are still schools being uh, blown, uh, they always try to distance themselves from, for example, from sectarianism, and there are attacks on Shia mosques in Kabul, and there have been many uh, that usually are, are, are claimed by the Islamic State. Uh, the Taliban uh, quickly put out a statement dissociating themselves. Uh, but they have not, uh, they're not willing to be part of the international system in, in, as we understand it in a modern sense. So they'll still uh, kind of committed to international uh, isolation of some kind. Uh, the peace process is a big thing in, in this town. Uh, the pendulum has swung tremendously from uh, President Obama creating a special office in, in, in the State Department just to promote reconciliation with the Taliban. Uh, to the other end where, uh, I mean, there are clearly uh, considerations, people are resenting the fact that they are not being declared as international terrorists. And then, of course, one of the enduring things, the, 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 uh, re the, the thing they repeat and perhaps that they justify their violence on is this uh, international military presence, which they call the um, uh, occupation, the US occupation. They typically refer to the Afghan government as a puppet government. Uh, and then one thing that is not talked about a lot, but I, I wanted to bring it today, is this whole idea of uh, happy afterlife. The Taliban are 
Uh, it's very clear from talking to them for the literature, for what they write, what they do is that they not only see their struggle in limited to this life, this world, but to a happy afterlife. And uh, they are looking for uh, heaven or Jannah. Uh, so this is, this is one of the key things that drives them uh, and, and do what they are doing. Um, they have uh, some unique strengths which we need to understand to understand their strategy. Now, I m must make clear that I mean, I've never come across, and I'll be very happy to have that document. The Taliban have, do not have a strategy document that lays out their five-year plan or 10-year plan. They usually say whatever they say in a very domestic, Afghan audience-oriented um, literature, uh, which is very Islamic. I mean, you need to have basic understanding of Islam and even some Islamic education uh, theological education to understand that. Uh, so uh, one of the key things that, that distinguish them from a lot of Afghan movements in recent history, that they are largely a united movement. There have been small, there have been defections, people have been arrested, uh, but they are, they've largely survived all this. And this is remarkable in Afghanistan's context because even people who were taken to Guantanamo, who spent years in Guantanamo, went back and joined the Taliban on the battlefield. Um, they have a centralized leadership. There is a shura by the name of Quetta Shura. Uh, nobody knows exactly where it is now, but I mean, the, it's still seen uh, largely to be based in Quetta, or maybe part of it is now in Helmand in the southern province of Afghan, uh, Afghan province. Uh, and then what is key uh, today to their war is that they are fighting a decentralized war. They have centralized leadership, but local commanders can do whatever they need to do to survive and capture territory, regulate public life, make alliances, break alliances. So they are fighting a decentralized war in, in that sense. And that was something that was uh, encouraged by the previous uh, Taliban leader, um, uh, uh, Mansoor, uh, Akhtar Muhammad Mansoor was killed in a drone strike last year in Pakistan. Uh, they also have very complex information uh, operations. They have, for example, a website, which is a multilingual website. Uh, uh, they publish a magazine by the name of Al Samud in Arabic, which is, uh, I mean, hardly anybody speaks, the Arabic is not a native language of Afghanistan, hardly any Afghan uh, uh, speak Arabic, but they have this magazine primarily for their donors or explaining their positions to other Islamists in the, in the Middle East or donors in the Gulf region. Um, and then uh, they also have like Twitter, it's sometimes easy as a journalist, a lot of my colleagues in Afghanistan tell me this, that it's easy to get a statement out of the Taliban than the government or the international forces. So that, that's, uh, that's, and then they're also on social media, there are a number of Taliban Twitter accounts, Facebook pages, whenever there is a debate, you will clearly see that like out of 10 people, there will be always a Taliban sympathizer. Sometimes they challenge you, sometimes they approach you, but they are very good at putting out their message. Um, and one key thing in Afghan context is that they um, have uh, established in Afghanistan a monopoly over jihad, which is a key thing to understand because they don't want any other group to be claimed to be fighting a jihad in Afghanistan. And a good example of this is the Islamic State. Since the emergence of Islamic State, uh, Khorasan province in Afghanistan and Pakistan in 2000, early 2015, in January 2015, the Taliban have fought many battles against them and it probably um, caused them a lot of damage. And um, in 2015, the former Taliban leader, Man Akhtar Muhammad Mansoor, wrote a letter, open letter to uh, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of uh, Islamic State, or Daesh. And he said that one of the key quotes is that something along the lines that, look, in Afghanistan, you do whatever you do in Iraq and Syria. That's not our business. But in Afghanistan, it's us. Uh, this leader, the current Taliban leader, uh, Molvi Haibatullah, wrote a whole book. Uh, it's called um, The Jihad La Shawane, or the, the way, the teachings of jihad. So he has taught, it's a detailed uh, book about how to conduct jihad, what to do, what not to do. 
And one key thing in, in Taliban terms in Afghanistan is patience. They are not impatient. They don't have budget cycles and elections and, and all these things that we deal with this town. In, so they are patients. For example, in two, uh, President Obama, when he announced his strategy in 2009, and, and then there were deadlines, they simply waited the American troop search. They, most of the Taliban simply hid in Pakistan or somewhere else or lay low. So they didn't had the, the surge didn't break their organization. It didn't dismantle them like something similar. Uh, I mean, something that perhaps happened in Iraq and, and other places, but they didn't happen in Afghanistan. Um, now, their way of war is also uh, interesting and, and sheds light on their strategy, what they want to do, how they want to go about it. First thing is that it's low cost. The Taliban operations are not multi-billion dollar operations. Uh, they have, there is all this talk about like Taliban using drugs. Yes, the Taliban use drug money. Yes, they are dependent. They, have, they get a lot of money from drug, drug lords since the beginning of their movement in the 1990s. But everybody else in Afghanistan benefits from this. There are a lot of people um, on the government side, if not now the key figures in the government, that have benefit from the drug trade. So uh, they are not, it's not their exclusive control, but in some cases locally, maybe they have a monopoly or for example, drug tr trading routes along all these borders and stuff. Then um, what they have done since 2014 is that they have increased their ruler control. I'll show you maps later, but it's remarkable how much territory they control or dominate today. And they pretty much operate in every, everywhere in Afghanistan now. They are no longer, uh, initially in the 1990s, they were, it was said that they are only a Pashtun movement. Um, they, they're not that. Um, uh, one of the other key tactics is this reliance on urban attacks. They have repeatedly, Kabul is the most bomb city in the world, I, I think now. Uh, it, so the, 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 their strategy is to uh, not to let Afghan government take hold and secure in, in these spaces and be secure and be safe in these spaces. For example, uh, in, in May or June this year, they, um, there was a massive truck bombing in the heart of uh, Afghan capital in Kabul, close to many embassies, and that was a clear Taliban uh, message of what they can do. After uh, President Trump announced a strategy in uh, August, the Taliban uh, issued a statement, they launched many attacks in October, um, and, and one of the messages they put out was that these uh, uh, attacks uh, show that the Taliban are managed well, uh, that their main power is disciplined, and they are using their own resources for achieving their aim. So it's very much part of their thing. There is a lot of talk about Haqqani network, but I can tell you that Haqqani network is kind of now uh, weakened uh, compared to the past. It has lost many key leaders since 2014. It has lost its key sanctuary, Miran Shah, for example, you cannot kidnap anyone non in now in northern Afghanistan or somewhere and bring him to Miran Shah, which is the capital of Pakistan's North, uh, North Waziristan tribal area. Uh, and then, of course, there are Taliban special forces, these uh, better trained Taliban fighters who use, uh, they use in attacking isolated Afghan positions or, and then one of the key tactics that's uh, paid less attention to is the Taliban assassination campaigns. They have killed a lot of Muslims, Afghan Muslims, most of them many very pious Muslims, uh, and that creates a lot of havoc. And they are now going after, for example, members of the Afghan security forces. They are uh, targeting the um, recruitment, men, men recruitment regions in northern Afghanistan, in eastern Afghanistan, they, 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 they go after key tribal figures, even a lot of Afghan ulema, a lot of uh, Afghan clerics who are not, uh, not part of um, the Taliban. Uh, so so that, that's one of their key things that they constantly um, uh, try to undermine their enemy. Um, so the Taliban now claim to control, in, in March de, this year, they claimed that they control 45 of 400 Afghan districts. Uh, one of good example of Taliban control is this southern province of Helmand, which is the largest in Afghanistan, something this, the size of uh, Switzerland. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, the latest figure from Cigar is that they 30% uh, uh, of Afghan territory is being contested, 13% is, um, is, is, is being uh, uh, ruled by the Taliban. Then just I'll quickly show you that this is one of the map from uh, the Long War Journal. This was in March when they mapped the Taliban claims. This is currently, uh, now currently, uh, those uh, with, with the orange, uh, they are contested. So you can see there are a lot of them and then the Taliban control, apparently control 45 uh, uh, districts in Afghanistan. Um, I, I'll leave the regional part. I mean, there are a lot of the, the region. I'll just uh, go to the, because we have time constraint, I'm being reminded. So um, I'll just quickly go to the future of, of the Taliban. Um, uh, the Taliban weakness is directly proportional to government's strength. As long as you don't have a working Afghan government that can deliver, first provide security to its, its people and then provide key services, the Taliban will keep on strengthening. There is no military solution to the Taliban. Uh, we have tried it because, I mean, they were routed, but they were not defeated in the sense they don't have these kind of cells. Uh, they, they function on a very different level, so it's not militarily possible to kind of kill all Taliban or capture all of them. Uh, because when you do that, you tend to bomb rural areas, and that created, and there are a lot of conflict. The Afghanistan is not one conflict, it's thousands of conflicts. In every village, there is a conflict between this Mujahideen faction, that Mujahideen faction, this tribe, that tribe, this um, sub-tribe, uh, this clan. So, so they, those, uh, those, the Taliban are very good at exploiting those. Um, one key thing is Afghan politics. This year we have seen that the Afghan politics have moved towards kind of ethnic fragmentation. Uh, there is a lot of uh, unrest, political unrest in the sense, a lot of uncertainty. But on the positive side, Afghanistan has changed. I think for the first time in Afghan history, um, uh, the, the countryside has accepted uh, this government, modern, democratic, central government. Um, so th that's a very good thing. Sustainable peace is important. And I also think I, I had to skip because of time uh, that uh, one key thing in Afghanistan is to uh, address regional concerns. The last point is that, for example, we have, uh, in 2001, we had all of Afghanistan neighbors uh, in agreement with the United States that the thing that the Taliban need to go. Today, that's not the case. Today, I think there is a lot of regional opposition to the US military presence. And, and that is something that I think, um, uh, apart from maybe India, but uh, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, clearly, and maybe China also. The, and that is something that we need to factor into uh, how to deal with the Taliban in the near and long-term future. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we've run up against the end of our time on this panel. We've got three questions. We've got time for three questions. Thank you, Willem. Okay. Um, if we're going to open up to the floor for questions, I'm going to take all three of those questions at the same time and then hand it over uh, to, the, to the panel. So there's there's someone there, if we get a microphone. Do we have our, do we have a microphone? Uh, yeah. um, West Africa, uh, Sahel, uh, what are your opinions and what are you hearing from uh, border states and uh, the um, countries around uh, concerning a growing footprint of Afri Africa? and also uh, the issue of armed drones in Niger. Thank you very much. There's one over there at the back. Thank you. Uh, how would you rate the counterterrorism operation, uh, Operation Barkane, uh, in terms of its presence not only in the Sahel, but also with those groups that you mentioned of, uh, in northern Niger, uh, Nigeria? And there's a lady at the front here. I have a question to Mr. Siddiqui, um, um, in particular northern Afghanistan. The, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, Taliban had an issue of uh, recruiting in the, from the northern parts of the 
and actually entering that, and, and they were unpopular among warlords and local people. So I'm trying to understand why was that, and uh, because of this Northern Alliance that came, and then how inability of Taliban to cross um, cross Amudarya into the Central Asia, the inability, how it, it formed to Taliban, how it kind of formed Taliban to what it became now, did it affect ever that, that they were unable to do that? Okay. Um, so we've got our three questions. I'm not sure that these microphones are working, so I'm going to, if we, if I allot these questions perhaps. Um, so Jacob, are you, would you, are you take, um, you want to take Barkane? Is that on the question related to Barkane and how states uh, perceive AFRICOM and growing intervention, if I look at this Nigeria-Mali region, I think each state has its own perspective and has had its own experiences. I think Cameroon, for example, has had a good experience with uh, U.S. Uh, troops and uh, U.S. operations in that country, and Boko Haram violence has reduced in the past couple of years. That might not be completely attributed to the U.S. being there. It might be related to diplomacy between the government and Boko Haram. But uh, you know, conflict ind indicators are still down in Cameroon. And the US footprint in Cameroon, like the intended footprint of AFRICOM more generally, has been pretty soft. I mean, we don't see drone strikes in Cameroon. We see training. Um, we, we see sharing of intelligence. And, and that's actually the AFRICOM approach. So um, what seems to be going on in Cameroon is, is, is I think, pretty good. Niger is to be seen. Um, now that we're setting up these drone bases and we just had US Special Forces attack, it's really unclear how it will go. It seems like from a state perspective, Niger welcomes a U.S. presence. And, and that also relates to Barkane because France is, is very busy and the situation in Mali is getting worse. And um, I think so far as France is concerned, they're not going to be able to be a sort of protector uh, for, for the entire uh, Northwest Africa region. And so I think, uh, you know, U.S. stepping it up can actually help fill a gap. Um, on, on this side, uh, if you look at Chad, because of this uh, travel ban, relations have fallen out with Chad and Chad was actually an important partner. So, so currently with Chad, things aren't good. But I think Niger, when, you, when I speak to uh, people involved in intelligence there, they really like the US presence and, and our support. Um, but it would be important for us to play a diplomatic role and see what the Nigerians want, just like we did in Cameroon. Probably local people are not as enthusiastic uh, about uh, US presence in AFRICOM because um, you know, in other regions of the world, uh, you know, drone strikes are at least reported to kill a lot of civilians, even if that's not always true. Um, because there's an incentive, of course, for insurgents to claim more innocent people were killed than, than were actually the case. Um, so I, I would focus my, my response uh, mo mostly on those aspects, but to only mention, uh, to, to reiterate that the situation in Mali is probably worse than, than we might imagine because attacks are so frequent and uh, the groups are evolving. And I just don't see how France can um, have a really big influence throughout the region without other countries uh, support, supporting them. And that's not only the U.S., there's other European countries involved as well. Well, actually, i um, not sure whether the first one was um, like directed towards me, but I will take this one and uh, uh, Berkan um, question like, um, there is a sort of, and living in the region, I have this perception now much clearer, a sort of contradiction uh, among the, both like the peoples of the region and the governments. On the one hand, they welcome external support particularly when it means money to the governments in terms of uh, training programs, etc. But at the same time, they're always particularly skeptical when it comes to uh, external powers putting the, the boots on the ground. Uh, in the case of France with uh, Operation Serval first and Operation Berkhan, later on, like the general perception is that these two operations were quite successful in, in quantitative terms in the sense of the amount of terrorists that were killed, some of them were also quite big names. Just I think about Abu Zaid, who was one of the key leaders of AQAM in the, in the Sahara Sahel region. But at the same time, these groups are so resilient because in many cases, like Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, but also like a number of other regional organizations, it's not that they have been, uh, they were born out of um, they simply arrived in the region, uh, started working with local um, groups that in many cases are normal crime, criminal organizations. They don't really have like any specific jihadist characterization. And like I don't really want to sound like an old orientalist, 
but the Sahara is historically famous for you know the illegal uh, like economy characterizing the region so uh, you can like to a certain extent stop these groups from operating there, but getting completely rid of them, I have the perception is going to be not an impossible task, but something very difficult to achieve. As for the American presence, uh, again, as I said, like uh, the perception of AFRICOM, like from certain intelligence services and governments in the region is very well perceived, uh, but it depends on the periods. Now with all what's going on, again, like, I, I've not been in Tunis in the past month, but what I heard from one of the, let's say, least radical countries in the region after the decision on Jerusalem was, let's say, all the parties of the political spectrum, also the most, let's say, secular ones, were totally against the, uh, this decision, and they were calling for people in the streets to uh, protest against that. So from this point of view, like many regional government, they see Africa as an element of, of stabilization, but at the same time, some of them, they would prefer to uh, operate without any external like interference. Although there, there is another contradiction because then we could talk about the role of Algeria in the region, in which they don't really want anyone to operate, but at the same time, they tend to stop at their borders because uh, you know, there is this strategic doctrine uh, based on the anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism approach that they should not interfere with the problems of their neighboring uh, countries. So from more like a North Maghreb perspective, like West Africa is not immediately my area of interest. This is what I can actually tell on both of these uh, things. Thank you. to be super quick, General Hayden is here. So um, on Northern Afghanistan, I think the Taliban are now very keen on showing that they are uh, transnational Afghan, I mean, uh, 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 pan Afghan movement. So they are keen on saying that they have uh, Uzbek and Tajik and Turkmen members into, uh, in addition to, of course, the core of Taliban, which is largely Pashtun. Uh, in Northern Afghanistan, I think the governance crisis and particularly some of the things, the mistakes that local strongmen have made have paid the way for Taliban to emerge, local grievances, for example, in Kunduz, in other areas. Um, and one key thing uh, about Central Asia, that the Taliban are very keen, uh, appear now, are very keen on preventing uh, the Central Asian extremists, uh, the remnants of uh, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan that were Taliban allies in the 1990s, in fact, the Taliban uh, invited them to come to Afghanistan in the 1990s to prevent them from establishing a foothold. In October, the Taliban fought a large battle in um, the northern province of uh, Jawzjan on Turkmenistan border against the Islamic State militants. Uh, the, these are primarily old uh, remnants of uh, IMU, and hundreds of uh, fighters from both sides apparently died. Uh, so, so they are committed to uh, not let the Islamic State or, uh, or Central Asian militants establish a, a foothold, which is, uh, I think, a very a major development compared to the past when they were keen on hosting Central Asian militants. Thank you. Th thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry that we've run over. I'd like you to join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.